OTB AM. With Gillette, get into your flow with the new Gillette Labs Razor with exfoliating bar. So if you went to bed early, you don't know that uh, the end of the Liverpool-Newcastle game was suitably um, uh, redolent of 26 and a half years ago, Johnny. Why did you go to bed early? Well, what were you thinking? I just had to. Yeah. It was a, it was a long day yesterday and um, some stuff was gone. Anyway, I'm like, I'm like Tom Brady who we'll talk about a little bit later on. I'm 45, I've got shit going on. Yeah, um, but it's nice. Up early. Like, it's nice. It's not like you had to like, you avoid, show, you know? avoid the traffic or whatever. I mean, the game is at a knife edge. Um, Liverpool clinging on in the title race. If there is a title race, I don't think there is, but they're clinging on. And it was a really, really like last minute kind of uh, drama. It wasn't quite up there with 26 and a half years ago, but it was it was gripping. And the stats backed that up. Um, Carvalho scores the winner in the 97, 98th minute. Uh, possession, 72% Liverpool, 28% uh, Newcastle, who only had two shots on target. Yes, were well in the game, strangely enough. Um, touches, 8-2-3 versus 4-4-7. Passes, 6-2-5 versus 2-5-6. And clearances, 4 versus 42. No corners versus 13. And Liverpool won it at the death. And, you know, you need these scenes to remind you that uh, football is just great. We talked about there's too much football on. So I watched it in a bar last night. I was kind of, my friend uh, recently, they had a baby. So I was there to have an excuse to have a pint and watch the game. You were wetting the baby's head. Wetting the, the baby's baby, head, even though the baby wasn't even there. Yeah. On one TV was Liverpool, Newcastle. On the other TV, as we will talk to uh, young Jack about, was the Arsenal game, uh, where Villa looked like they actually... Might get a point uh, very much against the odds, but didn't. Uh, we, we get to Arsenal in just one second. I just want to bring something up that um, it's 26 and a half years ago and you were feeling the heavy weight of time on your shoulders. I was, yeah. As I mentioned, like we're, I'm uh, going into the 40 club this year, but um, when, that was one of my like best sporting memories as a kid by a long stretch. That 4-3, it just had everything. And that was the season where, obviously, Newcastle under Kevin Keegan were a swashbuckling team. Stan Collymore with the winner. John Barnes pulling the strings in midfield. Um, I think I went to, like, a youth disco afterwards. Right. No youth discos anymore. And no. And did you get the shift? Um, did I get the shift? Not on that particular night, actually. I'd yeah. say it was a long time before after before you yeah. got one. Uh, you mentioned uh, young Jack. Jack Keegan is with us. He's the only Arsenal fan in the world who at the moment is still a doubting Thomas. He's refusing to lean in and enjoy the experience of being top of the table five games in a row. Also probably wondering what shift means in that context. <laughs> Don't worry. Uh, I like <laughs> to think I do know, thankfully. But uh, I, I am happy, but I still have my reservations about it all, Jared, to be perfectly honest. Top um, of the league. Are there specific reservations about Mikel Arteta? You just don't like, you don't feel he's got the charisma of Pep. He's got that bad haircut. What is it? I think he's got a quite a nice haircut, to be fair. No. I mean, I'm just not sold on Arsenal just quite yet. I've been a fan all my life, but this, something about Mikel Arteta's style of play just isn't it for me? I'm so used to the classic Wenger ball kind of play. Like, for example, the classic Jack Wilshere goal versus Norwich. But last night against Villa, there was just something that touched a nerve for me. That methodical, long build of play that we always see from Arsenal is really tough to watch sometimes. And I'm still not sold on it just yet. And a lot of it is reliant on defeating defenders one on one. So if you look at like last night, for example, they went down to the wings a lot into that kind of third channel and a lot of it was dependent on Martinelli beating Luca Dean or like Saka taking on Matty Cash or vice versa. Uh, they're, they're not like two of the best young players in the world doing that? Yeah, but like when they come up against competent defenders they're really easy to be nullified. Like I wouldn't be surprised if for example like say Martinelli comes up against someone like a Tariq Lamptey. He'd be shut out immediately like mm. because they have the wherewithal like that. And the thing is they haven't, so far Arsenal this season, haven't really tested their mettle against quite strong teams. The last three games were born with Fulham and Villa. Yeah, and I mean, the proof is in the pudding with that one. Bournemouth went and shipped nine goals against Liverpool. Mm. Villa haven't been very strong this season. I mean, when they beat Leicester 4-2, I mean, Leicester are bottom of the league with one point right now. So, I mean, I think a lot okay, of so people... They've, they've beaten nobody. That's your cause for concern. And also the style of play is a little bit too predictable. Yeah, there, uh, there's also some other things about Arsenal that I'm still quite hesitant about. And you're not going to like this one, but the issue of having enough bite in the final third. It seems that... I, <laughs> I'm going to get a lot of flack for this, but it just seems that Jesus is not the focal point that he's been so lauded for being recently. I, what I would like to see personally is him in a two with Nketiah, 
because Nketiah has come on exponentially as a player. Like his hold of play is far stronger than a lot of Arsenal fans give him credit for. And I feel like him and Jesus would pair up fantastically has together. Has he forgotten how to be a hold up player considering his Man City like role? Don't play with nine. Play a totally different style of football. Say that one more time for a chance. As, as Jesus like just like forgotten how to play that way. You're saying Nketiah would be that. Guy. No, I'd say Nketiah would be yes, a whole. As Jesus like he's not the. You're saying he's, he's never not been the, that though, right? I don't no, know. but he is the not. Well, like he's probably get man of the match last night. Mm. Um, I would argue that Granit Xhaka should have been man of the match last night. Yeah, Dude was uh, phenomenal. Who was who was on Cocom? Um, I remember being a bit surprised that he was on Cocom and then picking. Um, BBC gives Jesus. Martinelli second, Odegaard. Yeah, it was on BT, again. Uh, it was very hard to get a feel for any of the games as you were flicking, 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 flicking. Um, before you went to bed before the Liverpool winner. Yeah. Yeah. Glad you brought that up, John. Flicking as you just turn it off. Check the score in the morning so you'll miss nothing. What were you on about Arsenal, was it? <laughs> yeah, I think we are talking about Arsenal. <laughs> <laughs> um, in terms of what are their ambitions, right? They're not going to win the league. No, they're not. Can they finish second? No. The squad's too thin. Mm. It's quite thin as it is right now. So, for example, like Party, Zinchenko and Mohamed Anani are all out injured. So that leaves the midfield quite light. I mean, if, say, for example, Elneny gets injured, that leaves... Or, sorry, Elneny is injured. But, say, for example, Xhaka gets injured, that leaves Sambi Lakonga as their only out-and-out -out kind of holding midfielder. And that doesn't bode well because Arteta loves a holding midfielder and a box-to-box -box mid midfielder, mm. which has been kind of a staple, a staple of his kind of tenure at Arsenal. And I mean, that can go haywire pretty quickly because without a strong midfield presence, Arsenal kind of have crumbled. I can't think of one off the cuff, but I've seen it in the past and it hasn't, it hasn't gone well. I actually think when Jacko was put in that holding midfield position by himself, they lost 5-0 to City but they're in much, that infamous three-game run. They're a, much, they're a much better team now, though, right? And like oh, uh, yeah. Odegaard is the fulcrum of it. Like. And, and the other thing is that um, the, the, the characters in the dressing room who were setting the culture have largely been moved on, and so it is his team, and he has won all the power struggles at the club, and everybody understands that if you don't perform for him, you're going to be burned out. And that, that changes everything. And, like, um, I definitely think they're going to finish top four. And I also wouldn't be too worried about um, an injury crisis. They have enough money and they've obviously backed him enough where that if something happens, they'll get somebody at uh, in January. So... But what's really interesting just about the culture of Arsenal right now, so a lot of times in the past they would concede a goal and then the heads would go down. Aubameyang... Straight away last night, to be fair, yeah. So uh, just on that, like... The av so when they concede, the average time for them to respond is 3 minutes and 57 seconds. That's insane. This in, season. This, in, yeah, this, this season. season, in these five games. Right. But in the past, they, if they conceded, I can see literally vividly Aubameyang's head going down, Ozil throwing a fit. Yeah, and that it was impressive. No, Villa certainly helped them with their defensive they, shape for the goal. It was they, Yeah, Villa, Villa are the perfect team to uh, to get right against, and like uh, Bournemouth were for Liverpool. And, and I, I look, I, I buy the point that we shouldn't overreact to the fact that they've won five games that you would expect them to win. If you picked out these five games over the course well, Palace, of the season, Palace away, like, and they weren't in a row, you would still expect them, I think you still probably expect them to win. I think Palace are going to finish like uh, best of the third tier who aren't challenging for Europe, Europe yeah. but are actually safe from relegation. So that kind of mid-table, lower mid-table well, gelatinous loop. Arsenal lost their first three games last season. So this start, by contrast, considering the following 33 games, they did very well. Like, they should be targeting second, I think. Targeting second. Uh, so Colin Foley cool. says, you're talking about the team that finished fifth last year. Of course there's holes. Just enjoy the wins. It's what football is all about. Uh, uh, you're policing you're like uh, who was policing the Arsenal fans Richard uh, Keyes Richard Keyes <laughs> yeah <laughs> police. Of morality. I, I do think that there are a lot of fans who actually enjoy the perpetual knife edge of oh my god this could go horribly wrong like it's all, but it's the signings they've made from last season like I think in, in terms of like the Arteta project they're probably I would say Jack they're probably quite more advanced than they were 12 months ago oh yeah it's night and day mm. I mean like the difference between Lacazette and Jesus is mm. immense. Like within three games, Jesus had more touches in the box than Lacazette had all season. So take from that what you will. <laughs> That's mad. Uh, he's, he has completely been a tone setter and it's been a, a great signing. But they also do now have strength and depth. Like Sinchenko's out, Tierney's in last night and you, you can deal with that as opposed to Tierney being out and they had nobody. So, it looks like um, he signed well. He, yeah, and it looks like he's signing for... Uh, plan as opposed to the, the scattergun approach that some other clubs have at the moment. 
Um, uh, so final point on this then, like honestly, they're going to finish top four. That's like success or bust is top four this season, right? Yeah. Well, yeah, it's top four or bust. But the mad thing about it is if you take Tottenham's 71 points from last season that got them fourth place, that's Arsenal already 21% of the way there. Now I understand the Premier League season a mar- Premier League season is a marathon. This one in not particular, sprint, yeah. but that's kind of scary. The question that- is though, Jack, how are Villa? How are Villa? Oh, I completely agree with Mick. It, uh, it does not bode well for Villa. They looked really devoid of kind of any attacking poignancy, any sure. threat, any venom. Venom. Mark, Mark Hogan, Gerard out. Shocking tactics. Shocking man management. He's a disaster. What I, I am interested in as a Villa fan, what does Gerard? What are his attributes as a as a good manager right now? What does he have? Like he, he's a celebrity, right? That's not really a. That's not really exactly. music, like well, celebrity. you can get you can get washed up former teammates to come and join you on massive inflated contracts. That's very important in world football. It turns out. I thought, I thought Coutinho started well. He started well, yeah, and then completely fell off a cliff over the last five, six, seven games last season, kind of in and out. And then you're like, okay, that's grand. You're good to like, you know, get a bit of buzz going. So don't sign him because you don't need to waste that money and that contract and that space and that opportunity for Buendia, who you could turn into something maybe under the right management. And they're like, no, we're definitely keeping him. We definitely want mm. like I, the agent was like, oh, Newcastle are gonna come in here and sign him. Like Newcastle aren't stupid, it turns out. They have they've made very few stupid signings so far. It looks like the signings they've made have been relatively. We're going to talk about them later in the show, but they're definitely challenging for Europe. I think on the base of uh, last night and the signings they've made, they were like the stats would suggest Liverpool were absolutely all over them. It wasn't quite like that. Uh, yeah, we've got Craig Hope coming up a little bit later on to talk about it. I mean, the biggest thing that's happening in football is Ireland playing tonight. And if we win, we're going to a pre-qualifier tournament to the World Cup. Mm. And then we're going to qualify for the World Cup because that tournament looks like it's relatively straightforward. So we'll talk more about the Premier League later on. We're going to talk about Ireland in just a few minutes' time as well. Uh, I should point out that, um, sorry, just to go back to uh, J- Jack, you're a glass half empty kind of guy, right? Oh, just, 100%. Also a Sean and, Rovers and fan. That's, I was going to say, <laughs> this is totally legitimate. You know, as a Rovers fan, you're like, oh, what do I do with this feeling of success? Oh yeah, it's you also very you're also an Irish rugby fan. It's like, what? Well, how do we? What do we? You know, this is unknown terrain for me, Jack. Exactly, exactly. And so that has conditioned you not to fully enjoy or relax until until you can put your hand in the wound and take out whatever it was that Dieting Thomas held up to his mates. Oh look, that, that's Jesus' blood. Mm. <laughs> Seven forty-three this morning. If you want to get in touch, we'd love to hear from you. Um, thanks, Jack. Pleasure. A, a, an accomplished debut. Cathy McNamee is going to join us just a moment to talk about the Republic it was an, it was a, what, would you, what would you give him a stats out of 10? 8.3 out of 10? 9.3 out of 10? You tell us, Jack. You, you mark yourself there. Yeah, I, I, think, I think he did very well. He, he has a future, the young man. Your mic is still on. That's how that works. You oh, can, right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, I'd give myself a... A six and a half. All right, there you go. Which is a Good clear indication. I want to come back and better that. Yeah, there you go. We can all get better all the time. 7.43. Eamon Coughlin's going to join us in studio at 10 past eight. He's going to talk to us about the Griffith Avenue Mile, which is happening in a couple of weeks' time. There's still a few tickets left if you want to... Johnny, you're a good runner. You could run a mile. I'm not a good runner, but I did... Uh, he's going to talk about Griffith Avenue. That was actually my go-to place to run uh, when I was in college in DCU. Um, beautiful part of town, yeah. And um, the benefits to one's physical and mental health, uh, obviously, are great. Yeah, we're talking about Irish Athletics and the season that we're having at the moment as well, or have just had. Uh, Keen Fai is going to join us at 8.50 to preview the NFL season. Some interesting cuts over the last two or three days, and the quarterback carousel is finally coming to an end. Craig Hope is going to join us at 10 past 9 to talk to us about Newcastle. The heartbreak of last night, but the excitement of seeing uh, Isak come on. Yeah, like the... Because we Graham Hunter on the show two, two weeks ago, and he's like, or 10 days ago, and he's like, look, if you're buying him, you're buying potential because last season, you know, he was missing sitters. His, his confidence mm. was shot. Getting up and running like that, that's what you need. Eddie Howe is, Eddie Howe is a very, very good manager, and but for, like, the, the offside call was well marginal now. He was offside, but if the days before VAR he might have gotten away with it which would have put Newcastle 2-0 up and he's finished for that and the goal you're going to get excited yeah the finish for that was absolutely sensational right uh, OTBAM brought to you live each morning by Gillette Labs for an effortless finish to your day uh, during the week we'd asked you to get in touch you can obviously leave a comment on the YouTube um, stream but finally we got around to uh, adding the WhatsApp to the desktop so now it's really easy for us to get your messages straight away so 87 180 87 180 if you are WhatsApping us though you need to tell us who you are because obviously your number doesn't uh, it's not attached to a name so you're just a randomer 
it was like sliding into our WhatsApps, which is fine, you can do that. But all the good stuff, we don't get any credit for it. So we asked somebody to mock together a bad Photoshop of Owen on Mount Rushmore. And lo and behold, we got this, and it's, it's absolutely perfect. <laughs> I don't know which of the uh, dead presidents Owen Sheehan is looking like there, but he's definitely happier than all the dead presidents. So, uh, yeah. 87 180 for more goodness like that. Just um, make sure you uh, append your name to the message and we will give you credit for your creativity. It is uh, 7.45. Is there anything else you want to talk about last night's football, briefly, before we get on to the proper football? We never mentioned Haaland. Um, oh, yeah. He's averaging over two goals a game at the moment. I think they play Villa next, is it? Um I, I do remember David Connolly just saying start of the season, yeah, he's going to finish top scorer. There's literally no, and he's gone from 11 to 4 into 7 to 2 on in the space of four or five games. Uh, he's a monster. And it turns out Premier League actually isn't as much of an obstacle to Haaland's greatness. And what is he like? Wait until Tyrone Mings gets him. He won't like, he won't like it up. Tyrone Mings is going to elbow and kick him and come on, Tyrone. I think, I think Man City are of the. It's now Tyrone Mings standing between Stevie G and the sack. Kind of ironic given the man management. Oh, he's got to look me in the eye to get back in the team. Now it's like, Tyrone, please, please, please save my job. Please. What's Is there anything gonna, you can do to stop Haaland? What's he going to do? Um, yeah. He could, I don't know, he could play, like he could conceivably get injured after 18 games and finish top score oh, he's gone. It's, yeah. it's, um, but it, I do like the fact that, you know, his dad played for Man City. He used to be like playing the ground as a kid. Um, he's and then they became the richest club in the world and could afford him. Uh, yeah, it's it's a lovely from story. The, apart from that. Yeah, part, well, yeah. that's why, you know, that's the important bit. He only signed for them because they have the most money. It's nothing to do with the fact that he was running around the stadium. It was, was it even that stadium? It wasn't. Uh, it was Main Road. Main Road. But no, to be fair, he kind of did have an allegiance towards Man City and his father goes yeah. to games. And I, I mean, that Man City thing is horrible in general, but um, Haaland isn't. No, I mean, how many goals is he going to get, Jer? I don't know. The forty target now looks. He's already nine. It'll be, it'll be disappointing if he only gets forty, right? <laughs> it's seven forty-seven. The Premier League, as we've been talking about, is back. We have teamed up with one of Europe's largest sports events, ticketing and hospitality companies, Champions Travel, to give you the opportunity to win a two hundred and fifty euro Champions Travel voucher every day this week. These can be used on Premier League match trips as well as a host of other sporting events. But daily winners will also be entered into our grand prize draw where one lucky winner will win a trip from a selection of Premier League games with flights and two nights accommodation included. To enter, all you have to do is tell us who this voice from Mayfield is. In different parts of your life, when you're at home with your family or you're, uh, you're going to work or you're playing on a Saturday at 3 o'clock, I think you, you, it is an act. It is a different show because you can't, you're obviously not acting like that when you get home or... Right, it is an act. Uh, you can tweet us your guess on our main Twitter account, which is at off the ball. 21 years since Ireland beat Holland 1 0, or the handshake, as uh, Colin has been referring to it. Jason McAteer reduced to a bit part player on the day, you know, with the, with the goal that slayed Holland. But anyway, we'll talk about that a little bit later on as well. Kathleen McNamee is with us. Kathleen, good morning to you. Morning, guys. Emma has arrived in in her Ireland jersey today, which means that um, everyone's off to Tala. Exactly. Mm. There's a, just a bit of excitement. This is. Um, a little bit. This is proper. Seven o'clock kickoff. It's on the telly. Winning in, basically. Basically, yeah. I woke up on Monday with a pit on my, in my stomach and just all week it is getting worse and worse. I don't think I've actually ever felt this way about a match after like spending... I think it was after covering the Euros for a month and realising that we should have been there. There were so many teams that we were better than. It just made this seem all the more important and all the more pivotal to this squad because we're not really going to get an opportunity like this I don't think for another while. So just explain to anybody who is unaware of the uh, the opportunity here right the, there's basically two teams left who have the opportunity to get the final playoff place in this group we're one and our opponents tonight Finland are the other what has to happen for us to get it what has to happen for them to get it? Basically both sides need to uh, need a win uh, if we get a draw tonight it's not the worst thing in the world we can get a win against Slovakia next week and it'll be fine but they still have to play Sweden so for them in particular tonight is going to be really really important um, they had a really bad Euros they've lost their manager in the last couple of weeks I think it was about five weeks ago that she was fired because of how badly they formed they were in a bad group and I don't think a lot of people expected them to get out of it but they only scored once and that was in the first minute of their opening game so it wasn't the best experience for them um, and there's just, we beat them away, which wasn't expected by a lot of people. We've had some great results against Sweden as well. We have shown 
exactly the side that I think everyone has known has been there for a while. We just needed someone like Vera to come in and pull us together a little bit. So if we let this one go, we're really, we're, we're going back to old habits. And well, it's like, that's a disaster. Yeah. For all the progress, for all of the uh, buzz that's around the team, for the fact that like they now have crossover stars who are just known in a way that uh, the women's football team hadn't been known up to this point, for us not to qualify, or at least not to get to the playoffs to qualify, that would be a disaster. So there's a lot riding on it. And this week they've kept being asked, which always makes me nervous, is like, are you, are you nervous? Have you been nervous? You, yeah. You've got a big test tomorrow. Are you nervous about the test? I'm like... Uh, stop, the, the, stop, my, stop making me nervous <laughs> like you're going to talk about set pieces but the first goal is going to be massive like so if, if Ireland go behind Finland who you know obviously there's this like there's a new manager in all be the temporary manager they might get like they, they, they effectively know if they win their last two games say you know they're there um, if they get the first goal they realise they're good enough to win this game and I think that's what Ireland probably need to be very wary of Definitely, and you mentioned about the set pieces there. Like the majority of the goals that they score are either counter attacks or set pieces. Now, we can benefit off the counter attacks, especially because their full backs like to get quite high up the pitch, and that leaves a lot of space, and that's what damaged them a lot during the Euros. Set pieces, again, have let us down in the past, and stupid mistakes in defense have let us down in the past. I think we've mostly cut those out in the last couple of games that we've played and we've seen, you know, Courtney Brosnan has come out leaps and bounds compared to when we were trying to qualify for the Euros. So I think we do have the capabilities to defend against it, but it's also just, we're going to have to be very well set up. Vera does prefer to set up defensively. She's not the, exactly the sort of player who ever sets a team up as if we're going to be playing attacking, flowing football. Um, but yeah, that first goal is going to be crucial. But also, like, it's a sold out crowd at Tala. Hopefully everyone who's bought a ticket will actually turn up and I think that's going to be massive on the night if Ireland do go down first before um, getting a goal of their own. I think that that's going to be the thing that actually pulls them through because like you guys said, like all week they've been around. There's been loads of grassroots clubs coming in to open training sessions to see them. They've There's been a lot of good feeling towards this team and as well as people asking them, are you nervous? This is basically a final, how are you feeling? There's been a lot of that support on the other side, so I'm hoping that that's the thing that's sticking with the team more so than the... It, it comes to the managers. If you look at Vera's press conference, she was very relaxed. She was, she was cracking a few jokes, and I think that's a good sign. Mm. Oh, yeah, she's also a hard woman to read as well. I think yeah. <laughs> you never really know what Vera was actually going on in her head. Uh, and even things like... She's not afraid to say what she thinks. I mean, after the last game, she said that she wanted to play Walsh in goal and ended up with Brosnan because Walsh was still had a bit of a niggly injury. And the fact that she would admit that on television uh, and after the performances that Brosnan put in, I was like... I was interested that she was so willing to say that so openly. Mm. And I was like, is this a call to the two of them to kind of say, you know, that position is still there, it's still up for grabs... Um, I think a lot of people would have thought that Maloney would have got the nod ahead of Brosnan in the first place anyways. So that in particular is an area I'm interested to see what she does tonight. And I'm interested to hear what she actually says about it afterwards because you would think at this stage, as good as Megan Walsh is, like she's one of the best def uh, goalkeepers in the WSL and I think sometimes flies under the radar a little bit in that regard. Brosnan has earned that starting place to me and she has proven herself over the last year that she can come on so much and that she can command a goal in a way that we just haven't really seen from Irish goalkeepers since Emma Byrne was about a good friend of the show. Mm. Um, so, yeah, uh, that's probably one of the areas that I'm most interested to see what Vera Pau does because she also doesn't like changing around her team all that much unless she has to. So, um, what are the relative strengths and weaknesses of, of um, Brosnan versus Megan Walsh? I think with... Walsh, she is just she's a lot more experienced than Brosnan is. I think Brosnan has the advantage that she has been in the Ireland setup a bit longer. She has worked, you know, she's had the game. She had the Sweden game. She's had that game against Finland. She has had that Ireland experience. She's well linked up with the defenders. Walsh is probably good enough that she can slot in there and still do a good job. But I think, especially when we look at how we've played in the past, certainty in that area is so important for Ireland because it has let us down at such crucial moments. And I think for me, that's kind of why Brosnan pips it slightly at this time. 
I don't think we should go changing a recipe when it's working for us at the moment and when a player who is clearly come on so far and is in good form and she's now getting that starting position at Everton as well by the looks of things by the look of pre-season you know she seems to be on a good upward trajectory and I would just be cautious about changing that at that, this stage that's big, communication at the back is always been is something. she a talker yeah is she yeah. like yeah well she wasn't for a while and that's what let us down but she has really come on and that and her positioning has come on so much with regards to her defense I feel like she's a lot more confident now and actually telling the defenders where to go and what to do so yeah I would just be hesitant about changing it at this stage but so much goalkeeping is literally like your defenders trusting you as opposed to what you're actually doing yourself in my view yeah and I mean like Megan Walsh has an incredible record I'm sure the defenders will trust her they just don't have that big game experience together yet and that's why I would be a bit she, hesitant. She played in the game, uh, Walsh played in the game against Russia in that Pinatar Cup mm. back in February. Yeah. Um, so obviously there was like a proper opportunity for the coaching ticket and the defenders to build up some trust in that. that like they were away in camp for a good while around that period. Um, so we'll know an hour before kickoff. Your <laughs> yeah. instinct seems to be that uh, Courtney Brosnan is going to get the nod. Uh, I actually, I really don't know. I think she should, but I actually don't know what Vera will do. Okay. Because that, yeah. I think that if she's willing to say in the last game that she wanted to play Walsh and she didn't, and this is such a big game, I think she might make that call. So I'm interested in this. Like, if you if you look at the, the bookies' odds tonight, Ireland are by no means overwhelming favourites, right? So at start the group, who is expected to finish higher, Finland or Ireland? Finland. So what's gone wrong? Uh, I think... Finland are on a downward trajectory and we've very much been on an upward trajectory since the group stage started. So with Finland, they obviously they qualified for the Euros. It was quite a scrappy qualification process for them. It was last minute goals against Portugal and Scotland that managed to get them through. There had been a lot of changes in their coaching ticket in the run up to the Euros and a lot of talk around there not being all that much happiness with and signal who's now gone and that the under-17 coach has taken over as interim manager. Like, even before the Euro started, there was talk that she was going to be gone by the end of so the Euro. That, that, that has to be a worry then. So if you're if you're going into a tournament and there's talk the players aren't happy with the manager, it doesn't even matter who the replacement is, she's gone. So, yeah. so there's going to be a bounce tonight, probably. Probably, yeah. yeah. And that's... So they're going to have... Or they're a complete shambles at this possibly. stage and they've just gotten somebody in-house to get them through the last few games and they're thinking, OK, well, we're not going to the World Cup, so let's plan for the future. That's, yeah. that, you know, a big range of outcomes on, on the table here. I don't, from the way they've been speaking, I don't know if that's what they're looking at. I think they feel a bit aggrieved with how their Euros went. I mean, they were in a group with Germany, Spain and Denmark, so, you know, wasn't really expected to do all that much. But they've been unfortunate as well this week in that their two main midfield players, Alan and Eggman, have both been injured. We have Nif Fahey out, which isn't great, but it would be like losing Katie McCabe and Denise O'Sullivan, essentially. They're their two best players that they've lost? Yeah. Okay, and that's in the, uh, specifically in midfield, so... Yeah, a very well, specific area that we can target. Uh, obviously less, uh, so I think um, Nif Fahey has a groin injury and hasn't yet to be ruled out for the... the yeah, the they g- said she, they're sending her for more scans and then they're going to see if she can play for Slovakia. Vera Powell was kind of iffy on it. She didn't right. really say one way or the other. A, we currently have a great relationship with uh, Liverpool and the medical team there, so I'm sure they're like, oh, that's fine, you you, you do what you want with her. <laughs> uh, anyway, um, those two players, Alan and Engman, who are out for Finland, uh, how much, what can we do with Nifahi out? Like, how, does, how do we uh, counteract that? What's, what does our team look like, basically, without Fahey? Well, I don't think Vera Powell is going to change her shape all that much. She has been lining up beside Darren Caldwell and Louise Quinn at the back mostly. In she says a back three, but generally it ends up being a bit of a back five because she Vera Powell just loves that defensive style of play. Uh, any Which is re- interesting. Like you wouldn't. Yeah, I was going to say any regular listeners to Koi Gig will know Karen Duggan's issues with the general setup of the whole thing. She wants to see more Katie McCabe up front, as do a lot of you. I mean, C Ronan was on the show and she was saying the same thing yesterday. Um, and uh, so we we basically play Katie McCabe left wing back. Yeah, I'm coming around to it. I gotta say, like, to, you well, know. I think it could be interesting on a night like tonight because with Engman out, I think that's going to give a, Katie a lot more space again to keep putting going up the wings and to kind of 
and step into a, midfield, right? Yeah, like, and make more of an impact, especially down that side. Um, it was Engman who scored against us last time as well, so always good to have a player like that out. With Nifahi out, I reckon they'll either drop Megan Connolly back a bit further, or else they'll put Megan Campbell in in her place because she's back in the squad. It just depends on how much, like, how fit she is. Um, so she has been out for a while with injury. So if, if you did a straw poll of Irish fans, where should Katie McKay be playing? Where would they say? Everybody's going to say number ten, yeah. right? Like, but so this is like an innate conservatism from Vera that like. Well, where do you play Trent Alexander Arnold? Yeah, but, that's what we're talking about here, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. Like your most creative, it's, effective well, sister. Yeah, and but you don't say tonight you're playing Finland, who are missing their two midfielders. You don't play Katie McCabe left wing back. Well, I, would, I would have thought. Well, if she, if she's our best player, if 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 uh, Joao Cancelo can have the influence on the game for Man City that he has by stepping into midfield, why can't Katie McCabe step mm. into midfield like she yeah. does, right? Yeah, oh no, she does. Like she still does it. She basically plays two roles in every game that she's in. I think Vera's thing is that defensive cover more so, like her. Yeah, like she she's our best. Like she's our best player, but she's also our best all round player. Right. In that she can do box to box. She can get back, put in a crunching tackle and two seconds later she's up the other side of the pitch scoring a goal. You know, she she and she has the fitness for that with Arsenal. It's a bit like Denise O'Sullivan, like because they're playing at this high level, they have the fitness for that sort of all round play. And our set pieces tonight are gonna to be big. Yes, set pieces are also going to be big. Especially because we do have the likes of McCabe, like Connolly is great, Risha Little John. We have a lot of players there that can take good set pieces corners, I mean, a Louise Quinn. If we go through to the playoffs on a Louise Quinn header, it'll be the perfect way to... With the 1-0 win. With a 1-0 win. Perfect. Probably oh, in the like 85th minute, yeah. minute or something. Yeah. And not, to be. not to try and create another uh, Kevin Kilban Nations League moment here, but the playoffs, when we get there, are relatively straightforward in that like we will be one of the best teams still who haven't automatically qualified, but in the playoffs? Uh, I don't think so. I think the playoffs are going to be more difficult for us than this stage, um, which I keep forgetting. I, I get overexcited and think that we're actually qualifying for a World Cup if we win tonight. And then I'm like, no, we have to go through the playoffs because the, from the nine runners up, the top three automatically go to the second round. Realistically, we're not going to be in the top three. We'll probably be in the bottom six. So we have to get through a first round match with them. And then once we do that, you'll play the top three that already qualified. And whatever the results are from that, go into a massive table that includes all the so group stage So the playoffs matches. are against European teams first? Yeah. Oh, I thought we were automatically up against the CONCACAF no. and stuff. Ah, okay, no. okay, okay. Um, and so then those results against the European teams go into a table that includes our results from the group stage. So like these matches aren't just important for now. They are important that if we make the playoffs, goal difference will so be important. So win tonight and win again uh, next week. And that's like catapulting us into, you know. A much better place. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. It's big for the FEI as well. Like we, you know, the FEI is looking for some feel good stories. Uh, still doesn't have a sponsor for the men's team. Um, this is a. I'm going to suggest is this going to be the most watched women's sporting event in Ireland ever, possibly. Probably at this stage. Which is, I mean, this I mean, is, if you look at the, watch this. If you even look at the viewer figures for the Euros, and I'd we weren't even in that. Yeah. Katie Taylor winning gold. Feel sport then. Yeah. Sport. Yeah, yeah. Team, bigger team than Ireland's yeah. Gaelic football final. Well, we'll see, we'll see, we'll see tonight. Um, kickoffs at seven o'clock. Hopefully, everybody is uh, sitting down, plonked in front of their telly, flags up, and uh, jerseys on. And I think it is a. There have been times before where tickets have gone, and they have been Maria sold, and then they weren't actually sold. They were distributed as opposed to sold. So you hope that this time they have been sold. And that everybody shows up and makes a raucous atmosphere, and they get in at six o'clock. Well, and if you have a ticket, like you know, make sure somebody who does want to go to this game, like, and make her or his dream come true by actually going to the game. Oh, I've know, had so many friends message me, be yeah. like, "Do you know if there's any tickets going? I can't believe it's sold out so quickly." Yeah, so if you're not going, like, you know, yeah. be a good soldier. Stick it on Twitter. If you have a ticket, let me know, and I will. <laughs> Make sure someone good gets it. We will be live from Tala pre-match on OTB Sports Radio from half past five. You're out there, uh, or here actually, doing the pre-match and then uh, jumping in a taxi and heading out. What, what have you got for us from half five tonight? Uh, we will be talking to Nathan, who's doing commentary, and Emma Byrne, and we'll also have Olivia O'Toole. So we have two legends of the game, and, and Nathan, Nathan himself. <laughs> Nathan yeah. regular in Tala, of course. Yeah, of course. Kids are Rovers fans. Yeah, yeah. Are you outing him there as a Rovers fan as well? Is he... 
Yeah, yeah, he's probably twixt and between a bit. Nathan Murphy and Emma Byrne will provide live commentary on News Talk Radio from seven o'clock this evening. And uh, as I said, of course, um, Kathleen back from half five on OTB Sports Radio. You just tell your smart speaker to play OTB Sports Radio, or you stick it on your app and you run it through your car system, and you can get it there. You are, of course, uh, an Arsenal fan as well. Are you also a doubting Thomas, or are you just having the crack at the moment? I'm very much just having the crack at the moment. Like I agree with a lot of the stuff that Jack said, but as a long-suffering Arsenal supporter, I'm just enjoying having being top of the table, actually watching the games, and not feeling the same sense of dread I normally do. Like I think it's like Jack was saying earlier, the fact that we are actually reacting quite quickly to when we go down, that's very unusual. Norm, I'm so used to the heads dropping and just being like, well, that's that. We might as well just blow the whistle now. Nothing else is going to happen. So it is nice to feel a little bit of peace. And after I know the inevitable downfall is going to probably come about November because that's generally when it starts happening and we'll suddenly be in seventh position and this will That's all seem spirit. like a little fairy tale to me. So I'm just going to enjoy it for what it's worth. I, I think on, on that note, like your positivity about Ireland tonight is quite notable, actually. Yeah. Give I mean, us your prediction. You think they're going to win. <laughs> <laughs> what, what, what is your actual prediction? Uh, I went for an optimistic 3-1. Oh, yeah, we would definitely be happy tonight. with that. Sue, Sue Ronan was like, we're two definitely going to win. 2-1, yeah. Yeah. So look, I know. think a lot of people are optimistic that we can win. There's just that hesitancy to say it, and like the players got to embrace the occasion. Yeah, That's exactly. The thing. They get, not, don't freeze. Just embrace this. Like, yeah. create history. Don't be nervous. Don't be nervous. <laughs> be confident. Don't be nervous. <clears throat> yeah. Whatever you do, don't fail. That's that's the spirit. <laughs> but don't be nervous. Well, I'm glad it's in Tala as well. I think it's you know it's their ground. It's their space. Mm. It's their time to take over. And I think McCabe is the best person to lead them on a nightlight tonight because she doesn't seem to feel big occasions. You know, even when we got the draw against Sweden, she was very much like, no, nope. it's a game. We still have a lot more to do. Whereas the rest of us were all <laughs> going crazy. I mean, like, this is one of the best results we've ever had. Yeah, no. Definitely, and um, that's why she's on all the billboards. Uh, all right, Kathleen, good stuff. We'll hear more from Kathleen, as I said, around about half past five. And again, on the show tomorrow, we'll also have Emma Byrne on the show reacting to whatever happens tonight. So, um, yeah, you should be nervous because um, there is a lot at stake. OTBAM brought to you live each morning by Gillette Labs for an effortless finish to your day. A reminder that Brayburn Coffee is the official coffee partner of OTB. Every week, we're giving one lucky viewer a €100 Euro voucher to spend on some Brayburn Coffee goodness at an Apple Green store near you. To enter, check out at Off The Ball on Twitter, like and retweet our Brayburn competition post and you'll be in the draw. Brayburn Coffee is Apple Green's new premium coffee brand that offers customers the best coffee experience on the road. It's available now at 30 locations nationwide. You said you were like a proud father the other day, stopping off at an Apple Green and having a Brayburn coffee, Johnny. I'll be, I'll be having a Brayburn coffee there and uh, it was absolutely lovely. There you go. Always be closing, Johnny. Ireland, who like has no history whatsoever of coffee, is now a far better place to get coffee than Italy or France, basically, which is mad. That, he, that is actually true. You've said some very outrageous things on this show before. That's, and that's the one that I think you're going to get the most grief for. But you might that's be true. right. No, the French are like, the French, do, they're very conservative. Like, we're not changing our coffee. The Italians are similar. You, you can't get good coffee over there. Ireland, you can get Brayburn coffee. After the break. Nicely gonna, done, wasn't it? After the break, we're going to be joining the studio. That's a lifetime supply for you. Wait next <laughs> And I need it. Back up the, the Brayburn coffee truck. After the break, we're going to be joined in studio by the legendary Irish athlete Eamon Coughlin. First, here's Ashling O'Reilly speaking to the Ireland captain, Katie McCabe, in the build-up to the massive game tonight in Tala. Katie McCabe, we're here in Tala Stadium. It's all going to be happening tomorrow night. The place is going to be rocking. It's absolutely going to be full because it's sold out. How are you feeling about that? Yeah, and no, obviously delighted with the sellout. Um, I can't wait to obviously come here tomorrow, see the atmosphere. Um, see, yeah, see the atmosphere for the game. Obviously, it's so important for us to have our fans here cheering us on, um, especially with such a big game. But no, I'm, yeah, I'm looking forward to it. And for you, is it a special occasion to be leading them out? I know friends and family are going to be here. It's never been sold out before. You know, it's an iconic moment, really. For me, every time leading the team out is a special occasion. Um, it's such a massive honour to do that. Um, of course, it'll be that extra bit special with a sold out crowd, friends and family, um, and obviously what's at stake. So, um, yeah, no, it's always, it's always special for me. And how has it been this week? The girls are all back in camp since Sunday. I know a lot of them were playing at the weekend as well, so haven't had a lot of time together, but uh, I suppose you've worked on things previously. Yeah, look, obviously it's a quick turnaround from uh, Sunday to Thursday, um, as it will be for Finland as well, but we've been yeah quite concentrated coming in. We've, we've done a lot of video work too. We've had two sessions. Obviously the final session will be here tonight. Um, but yeah, fully focused and we'll be yeah 100% prepared for tomorrow. 
you faced Finland before. It was 2 1 that night away in Helsinki. It was a brilliant result to go away with. Um, I suppose you didn't play particularly well that night. I spoke to a few of the girls the, the other day and they said, you know, you, you know, we looked at that game coming away saying we could play better than that. So I suppose you know the challenge that Finland possess. Yeah, of course. Look, obviously the win away gave us that confidence. Um, but we know Finland, they're coming off the back of a Euro tournament. They're going to have a lot of togetherness, uh, obviously, within their team. We know, obviously, they've changed managers, but we'll, we'll see how, how they kind of set up tomorrow night. But we'll be, yeah, fully focused and ready to do the job tomorrow. And we just heard the news about Nifahi that she's not going to feature through to an injury. You know, that's tough for her on such a, a big night to not be here. How is she doing? Look, Neve's been a massive, massive player for us over the last few years and within this campaign too. Um, she'll use her experience to rally the girls uh, tomorrow night um, and hopefully she'll be back fully fit for, for Tuesday's game against Slovakia. And just on the promotion of the game, um, it's obviously we talked about it being sold out. There's going to be a watch party happening in the city centre. Yeah, that's in Camden. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's happening in Camden. Um, you're on buses, you're on billboards. I've seen you putting up uh, an Instagram saying you're on the 77A. <laughs> I was on 77A, yeah. Do you know what? It's, it's, it's amazing. Um, the, the work our sponsors, Sky and Cabris, have done um, to, to get this game in people's faces and get that visibility out there. And obviously with the sellout crowd tomorrow it's it's going to be obviously fantastic and we're hoping whoever has a ticket comes and watches us or if you can't get to the game watch it on tv watch it at camden wherever it is but just be cheering us on is this the biggest game for you uh, you've ever played in an irish jersey i think they're all as big as each other in my opinion e each one um yeah means the world and for me it's 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 going to be the same tomorrow night otb am this is OTB Sports Radio. Off the ball. Anthony, Anthony and Anthony. That will be the front three for Manchester United. Martial, Alanga and Anthony. I've laughed <laughs> or sucked off that actually happened. There was this left back down at West Ham and I'd done him once and I went back and I'd done him again. And then I'd done him a third time and I thought, yeah, I'm going to have a go again. <laughs> like to ball around and I not make them and go by him. Anyway, he took me out about waist height, right? And I went down and I got up again. I turned to the referee and the referee said, you deserve that, man. <laughs> Subscribe now to the OTB Football Podcast stream wherever you get your podcasts and download the OTB Sports app. If your business relies on a van, that wouldn't sound good. But this does. Get up to 75% off van insurance. Now available in FPD branches nationwide. FPD Insurance. Support. It's what we do. 75% no claims discount based on five years claims free. Available on new van policies. Used for farm or business purposes. Terms and conditions apply. Underwritten by FBD Insurance PLC. FBD Insurance Group Limited trading as FBD Insurance is regulated by the Central Bank of Ireland. OTB AM. With Gillette. Get into your flow with the new Gillette Labs Razor with exfoliating bar. OK, it's 13 minutes past eight. A special treat for us this morning. We have the legendary Eamon Coughlin with us in studio to help promote the Griffith Avenue Mile, which takes place on Sunday, September the 18th. It's on at three o'clock. They're closing down the road and uh, it's for both elite and fun runners. Uh, families can do it and you can still sign up at griffithavenuemile.ie. Eamon, how are you? I'm fine, Ger. Thanks very much. Nice to be here. How did you get involved with this and, and how important is it to you? Because I know you, you took part in the first one, I think, ever. Yeah, well, the first one was held in 1983. And back then, um, we had the Fifth Avenue Mile in New York. We had the London Mile, the Rome Mile, the Rio Mile. So there was an initiative by IMG at a time when athletics became professional to try and get us athletes, world milers, in front of more people. Like Fred LeBeau from the New York City Marathon uh, organiser coming out of Madison Square Garden said to me one night, Eamon, 20,000 people watch you guys run fast miles. Why can't we get you run Fifth Avenue? And I go, what do you mean? He says, we'll have a straight run down Fifth Avenue. And I go, that's a great idea. Why don't we finish it at the Irish Tourist Board? Oh, yeah. 49th Street and Fifth Avenue. That's where I worked at the time. So, to long story short, Fred didn't get permission to do it where cross traffic would uh, impinge on it. And we did it along Central Park. That was the first one. And thereafter, they continued. So, 1983, ABC Wide World of Sports came to Dublin to show it live. We were originally going to do it maybe on O'Connell Street and do two laps of O'Connell Street, which would be a mile. So, so that wasn't able to take place and we went up to Griffith Avenue 
Avenue, which is a beautiful tree lined avenue, as you know, you live up that area. Nice part of the north side, really. It's isn't it? fabulous, yeah. fabulous. So we, we went uh, onto Griffith Avenue, Sydney Marie and Thomas Vessinghag, Ray Flynn, myself, a few Spanish, and Sydney won the race. I think he ran like 351 right. for a mile oh. uh, that particular day down Fifth, uh, down Fifth Avenue, down, <laughs> down Griffith Avenue. And it was part and parcel of that international circuit. It was to try and promote uh, the mile and milers and track and field more. And we pissed off that you didn't beat him? Uh, not really. <laughs> it was a good payday. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, I think I was third in the race. Sydney won maybe 351. I might have been 353 or okay. some, something like yeah. that. So it's a fast run down down Griffith Avenue. A really great run. And then after that, we went to Rome and we had 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 a Rome mile. So that was the start of it. And then it disappeared off the face of the earth altogether. And I think it was 2018. Uh, the folks up in All Hollows residence area up there and the Marino at Athletic Club said that they were going to put on an initiative and revive the Griffith Avenue Mile, but it was going to be to revive it, to bring the community involved, to get the young kiddies, uh, the older kiddies, <laughs> uh, and everybody in between, uh, p- wheelchair participants, and just create a really nice community atmosphere through the medium of the one mile run down Griffith Avenue. And it gives people of all ages an opportunity to say, well, how fast can I run a mile? Can I do it in 10 minutes? Can I break five minutes or whatever in between as well? And this year, it's back again because of COVID obviously it didn't take place so we would hope now that we don't have any setbacks with COVID in the future and this can continue to be an annual event. Yeah, so so I decided I'd lend my hand when I was asked by the organisers I said I can't run however I can help you to promote and talk through what the Griffith Avenue Mile is all about. When I, when I was in college I used to live like in Collins I lived basically around DCU but I did a small like 4k run that took in Griffith Avenue and that's the one part of the run I totally remember the tree lines it's beautiful like and it's some that sticks your mind because yeah. yeah it's just it's a beautiful part of Dublin yeah, and it was home for me in a sense. While I was born and raised in, in Drimna, uh, living in the States, going to college in Villanova, getting married, being on the professional circuit. When I'd come home to Ireland, I'd stay up in Glasnevin. So my wife's family lived up there. So that was uh, my locale where I used to run all around Griffith Park and Albert College. But uh, the Griffith Avenue run all the way down to Art School Reach. That's it, yeah. Uh, is where it finishes. Uh, that was always my favourite part because you could get a really good, fast run because it was gradually going downhill uh, towards the Holt Road. Um, good memories of that time. If anybody wants to sign up, you can still get on at griffithavenuemile.ie. And um, yeah, it's interesting that, that you're talking about the kind of the heyday of the milers. Is is there a possibility we could get something like that back where um, it becomes more, I don't know, more regular that we see the best milers run against each other in races on TV? It seems like it's the perfect TV sport. You know, it's short attention span. All you need is like 15 minutes to... Who are the runners and riders in this one? Who are the runners and riders in this one? Tell us a bit of the backstory. The race happens and it's, it's proper drama. Yeah, that's the way it was. It's, it's almost like nearly needs to be a breakaway, like the live tour <laughs> in golf. You know, something needs to disrupt uh, our sport because when you look at the American circuit, the European circuit, the Diamond League circuit, 1,500 metres, 1,500 metres. So the, the mile is something that's more or less forgotten about. Acronistic. Yeah, and only last week, would you believe, it was the anniversary of uh, Marcus O'Sullivan running his 100 sub four minute mile there are only three athletes John Walker Steve Scott and Marcus who've run over 100 sub four minute miles and people were saying well Marcus is the last person to go over 100 sub four minute miles uh, and he may be the last one ever to do it because they don't run the mile enough and the mile is something special because you can always relate to four laps or in a straightaway four minutes Um, whereas the 1500 metres if a runner runs 329 for 1500 metres the general punter doesn't go is that well, good? how fast is really that? Yeah. But if you say he's run 358 for a mile, you go, ooh, that's fast. Yeah. If you run 347 for a mile, you know it's super fast. So I think there is an opportunity to revive the straight miles in the streets. It creates a great buzz. Like Fifth Avenue had a half a million people. That well, first I was going to say, if you're a big city and it, it doesn't take the whole day like the marathon does, you could easily put something like this on yep. at you know, whatever, non-peak times and, um, and get a circuit going. Uh, yeah, and you, you, you can do a multiple of distances on a straight run. So those, the mile is going to be the target for most people, but then some people might want to just go 800 metres. Yeah. Or some of the kiddies might want to be tested over 200 metres or 400 metres. So you can create a perfect festival 
environment on a straightaway mile uh, in suburbia, uh, like on Griffith Avenue, for the whole community to really enjoy. And it brings the kiddies together, it brings the mammies and daddies together, and, you know, the whole community can get involved. You've obviously um, seen the evolution and um, the transformation of athletics over the last 30, 40, 50 years. Where is the sport at the moment? Do you think... Do you think it does need, and not just in the mile, but generally a bit of disruption? Um, like a lot of the best athletes in the world are kind of unknown for large portions of the yeah. Olympic cycle, maybe around the World Championships. There's there is some buzz, but it feels to me a little bit like the sport is lacking some way of selling its best participants. And every time we talk to them, every time we hear from them, it turns out they're really interesting characters and they're uh, always willing to speak about what you know what it is that has made them and there's you know there's a lot of extroverts there as well why why is the sport not mm. more why doesn't it have more crossover appeal to football fans and to yeah. you know the the casual sports fan good question jer um you know back in my era uh, the names were household names. It was on television, be on BBC, be on RTE, be on ITV. You know, it, the meets were, were live. Now, nowadays, they might be live, but you have to look for BBC Red Button or you have to look on YouTube. You have to really look. It's not on terrestrial television like it used to be. But back then, we weren't competing with the likes of soccer or Gaelic football or rugby or other, other sports um, as much as we are today. And with all the great personalities, the John Walkers, to Seb Coes, to Steve Ovet, the mammies and daddies and grannies, got to know everybody. And I think more important then, because there were Irish people in the mix with them, Ray Flynn, myself, Marcus O'Sullivan, then Sonia O'Sullivan came on the scene. Because there's an Irish person competing and beating them, there's a great Irish interest in it, and they get to know the people. Nowadays, unfortunately, there's too many great runners coming and going, if you like, from Africa, from America, from Europe, and are not necessarily round long enough for people to absorb the personality per se. And I think that is somewhat the difference between what it was like then and what it's like now. Yet, there is a disruption going on in the sport in terms of the new technology, in terms of the pacing mechanism that's going around the tracks now to try and bring get more people involved in it. And back then, if you had pacing lights going around the track, it was illegal. You'd be yeah, banned. Yeah. You couldn't do it. Now, they're trying to do that to give an interest at home to the people to see if the leaders can keep up with the pace lights in order to break world records. Yeah, and, and like I, I can see why they're doing that. And I can probably understand, too, why some traditionalists are like, well, you know... That's... It's not quite the same sport anymore when you have somebody, <clears throat> pardon me, pacing you. Those crop of Irish, <clears throat> sorry, athletes coming through at the moment, it feels like they're about to rekindle a massive uh, mm -hmm. a dam burst in, in Irish interest. Uh, are they good enough, do you think? What's your take on, on how our sprinters, for example, at the moment, setting Irish records at... Um, big European meets. We haven't had this in a long time. Yeah. Is this a breakthrough crossover moment for us? I Irish? think so, yeah. yeah. I really think so. And like the European Championships, for example, were, were great, wasn't it? Great, great viewing for the Irish athletes. And the range from Sarah Lavin running in the 100 metre hurdles all the way through to our middle distance runners, our field eventers out there. There's a great spread all the way across multiple of, of disciplines. In terms of where are we looking at the future, it's very tough beyond European level. That's exactly where we're able to compete and I think we'll do better as we go over the next three, four years at that level. When it comes to world level, world championships, Olympic Games, there's still a little bit of a way to go. Um, however, if I was to pick who potentially can you know, win at world championship level, you'd have to go to uh, Radisha uh, Adelecki. Uh, her performance is over 400 metres at 19 years of age uh, is world class. Do, no does, she, do, does she, can she reach her potential in Ireland because she's obviously decided that the States is the way to go for her um, and is that like one of the challenges that we have that if you want to be a top class athlete you kind of almost like footballer you do need to leave the country? I think you still have to go away uh, very much so and for someone like her she's in the perfect environment to get her to the next level the next level being world class level which she's already at but I'm talking about world class level and winning and and I think when she's down in Texas, where she, where she goes to school, she's actually serving her apprenticeship, if you like, down there over four years. She's halfway through now, and already she's becoming a world star. I think she only ran six 400-metre runs 
only this year yeah. and, mm. and she's gone under 50 seconds on a number of occasions uh, in relay splits so people are watching her so while she's in Texas while she's training in a perfect warm weather environment amazing facilities the people that she's training with are as good as her so in order for her to become a world star she has to beat them first so once she beats them which she's doing now all of a sudden she gets that confidence and belief in herself and says well hey if I can beat these guys I can beat the rest in the world. Yeah. So that's the environment that is afforded to her over there that's not here. Which is fair enough. Weather conditions. Yeah. Facilities are fine in Ireland now, there's no question about that. But I think it's, it's, it's the atmosphere, the environment and the people you surround yourself with helps to raise that bar all the way through. So you take uh, others. Um, Sarah Healy, she's a great engine, over 1,500 metres. She just lost a little bit of confidence in herself now this year. And she should just step back and say, OK, that's a year gone by, rekindle, regroup, get myself organised now for the next two years leading up to Paris. And I think Sarah, no doubt, can make the final of the uh, Olympic Games in, in 2024. Um, but my fear for Sarah is, and this is my only personal opinion, is she's not in that environment. Mm. she's the lead runner she's the one who's going to the track on the cold days with, with her mates but she's not being pushed by people that are better than her in, in, in this particular environment that's what America provides that Ireland does In terms of the promotion of the sport like what Kieran McGeehan did like that yeah. must have been worth so much like you had a smiling face all f mm. front of every paper like yeah. at her age as well it was just like it was a great story Yeah I was 30 years of age too and I won the world championship yeah. so uh, Sarah or should I say um, Kira, yeah. Kira hung in there because she went through a tough time the last couple of years or more uh, where she was maybe losing a little bit of confidence the niggles were there and there she was studying as to become a physical therapist in college so between pursuing her athletics pursuing her studies and the bits that were happening in between that she just went off but She's a real true champion. She won the world silver medal uh, as a junior, mm. beating all the Africans in, in the process pretty much out there. She's top pedigree girl. She's regained her confidence. She has a new coach now, uh, Helen Clitheroe, over in the UK, who's obviously got into her head in a great way and instilled that self-confidence back in her. And I think the best race that Kira has ever run was the European Championships from a tactical perspective At and a gutsy perspective. Mm. When she got in contention, she was in the top three going through the, what, the first two and a half laps. And when Laura Muir came from the back, right up to the front, she made an instant move and two strides, she was bump, gone. Well, Kira reacted to that immediately and she went after her to try and haul her back, haul her back. She almost was about to catch her and then Laura got an extra gear, went away, but Kira didn't give up. She kept going and kept going. And I was so proud of her and so happy for her that she came away with a silver mare, silverware there. Now, she's not finished yet. She's got two more good years ahead of her. I think what happened this year in the Europeans will give her a confidence to believe I can beat the best of them out there in the world now. It's funny because her quality performance came after the back of a similar quality performance in the Commonwealth Games, yeah. but it was the regular racing that, that really benefited. Yeah. I did want to ask you about that because... Yeah. Uh, Rashida Adelecki, you know, that was the end of her season. There was some talk in at one point that she wasn't going to go to the Europeans because she was so exhausted after, yeah, uh, after the racing. But like I remember talking to Ronnie Delaney, and also uh, hearing Sonia Sullivan uh, talking about it before. The American collegiate system it wears you out. Uh, is is one uh, glass half empty way? The other glass half full is you race and race and race and race and race and race yeah, and race. Yeah. And so as a result of the racing, yeah. you get into race mode and yeah. that's the bit you can't fake. It's yeah. like your whatever the equivalent of the 10,000 hours is, yeah. you're getting your competitive instincts honed, you're becoming tactically aware, you're getting your elbows out. Yeah. Like, literally and metaphorically yeah, yeah. In, in some distances. Yeah. And like America will either make you or break you. Uh, it'll make you if you're really good and you have the natural potential to be the best. Uh, it'll, it'll break you. Uh, if you're really, you know, not grade A runner, you might be grade B or grade C and you can't cope with the psychology of it out there. You can't cope with the physicality of the training out there and you're just not able to endure the hard work. But there's no replacement for hard work. And again, I'll just come back that the American system teaches you to win, 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 not necessarily run fast time, to get into the mix, to try and learn to win races from 
the back, from the middle, from the front, from, from leading it. So you're going to get every single little piece of the jigsaw puzzle uh, in every single race that you run and it learn you learn how to be able to cope with any type of situation. Because there's probably there's probably a sports science movement that says, Oh, that's too much, you're racing too much, you know? And the opposite side of that is actually, well, we might be racing too much, but in two years' time we'll have this in this experience. We might not run our fastest time this year. But in two years' time, we will actually be a better athlete because tactically and technically, we'll have an experience of it. So there's there's probably a bit of give and take, is there? Uh, there would be a little bit of give, give and take, all right. But sometimes science can get in the way as well. Sometimes sports psychology can get in the way as well, in my opinion. And I say that from the point of view that the sports psychology, you know, it doesn't come off the last turn and know what it's like to get down 100 metres to go with two or three people right on your shoulder and knowing and teaching you how to keep your hand over the candle the longest. And it's the guy who can keep his or her hand over that candle going down that final straight away to get pain. beyond the line, the hurt and psychological pain more than anything else. Um, and likewise, the other science that goes into it about strength and conditioning. I know some coaches who take uh, an interval training, let's say you're doing six times 1,000 metres, so you go off and you do your first 1,000 metres, the blood's taking a little bit of blood from your earlobe or your finger, putting it into a computer, saying oh, okay, I think you better back off right a little bit now. You know, that's kind of over the top as far as I'm concerned. The bottom line is, get out there, run your rear end off as hard as you possibly can in every single workout, and a good coach will be able to tell you, just looking at you, OK, we'll ease up today, we'll ease up today. But you have to constantly push yourself beyond, because you might think, oh, I'm so hard, I need a rest, I need a rest. That could be just psychological fatigue as opposed to physical fatigue, and a really good coach has to be able to identify that. One last thing I wanted to add, we had um, Daniel Kilgallen on, he's uh, Israel Alatunde's coach, and mm. he was saying that at the moment, obviously, so uh, Israel, I think, is living in Dundalk, going to college in UCD and training out in Tala. And he said, uh, America is not on the horizon at the moment, but there was definitely an implication that at some point down the line, he's still only 20. Yeah. So he could easily go to college in America yeah. and have a couple of years in the American collegiate system. And as a sprinter, you know, having reached his European level now, where he's running Irish records in a European final, if you were his agent or his manager or a, a conciliary, would you be saying it's, it's worth us having a few conversations with the American establishment uh, in the collegiate system and just yeah. seeing what's on offer. I'm not sure what his eligibility would be in America because of the number of times he would have competed for UCD here. Okay, so, so that for, might... Yeah, might not, so okay. for example, if he ran uh, his first year, second year, third year in Ireland in one race, the, 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 the collegiate championships, the university championships in Ireland, that would make him illeg in, illeg ineligible for America, except for one year. But if he's gone the fourth year here and even just run one race for, U for UCD, he'd be ineligible. But at the same time, he's perfect. He's, what, 20, 21 years of age now? He's at the perfect age, I believe, if he wants to raise the bar and get to the next level by going to the best camp for 100-metre trainers in America. The really good people there. He's going to learn new skills for training, uh, new explosive skills, starting skills, strength skills. How important is the start? Sorry? How important is the start at that, at that, that, that distance? Like, it must be... Like, it's probably the most important yeah. part getting out yeah. and I think psychologically if you can I'm not a sprinter obviously but if you can get out in a, out of the blocks really fast really well you, it strikes a chord you know that mm. you've done it and then the rest of the race will take care of itself but what uh, Israel has his real strong weapon is his ability over the last 30 metres oh he's powerful so I think if he was to get and this is with all due respects to his coach here right now who's done phenomenal work with him there's no question about that to get him and break the Irish record this year but if he, he'll need to take you know like three four tenths of a second which is a lot yeah. uh, in, in, in a 100 metres off his time and in order to just take those half a second or less off his time I think he needs to go to the next level by being in that environment being in that mix with the best 100 metre coaches that are available how good to could him. he be? Well, how good could he be? I think he'd be good enough to win a European Championship. Uh, would he be good enough to win a World Championship? I doubt that. I doubt that. And that's not a criticism of it. It's just, that's again, an opinion mm -hmm. uh, of him. It's a long way. It'd be like asking uh, uh, a, a miler, for example, who runs 356, um, and he's running 356, 357, 356. Okay, a change in training will get you down to 348. Mm, it really won't unless you have the talent. It's a big jump. You just have to have that extra natural ability uh, to be able to, you know, hit 
the fast times on a regular basis. The one thing is that it inspires everybody who comes after them to, that's the target now. And, yeah. mm. and so it, it gets harder, but yeah. it also, you're going to have to be genuinely international class to get that again. And so all yeah. of a sudden, uh, you hope that it, it brings people through, that we yeah. now have the systems in place. You, you mentioned well, I think it will, because Ger, after watching the European Championships um, and the excitement generated by the media, the performances of all our, our athletes there, the kiddies in the clubs want to be just like Israel, want to be like uh, Adelecki. They want to be like the others there. They're talking about it. So in my running club, uh, MSB, Metropolitan Harriers and, and St. Bridget's, um, the amount of inquiries that have come into our club in the last few weeks alone is unbelievable. There's a waiting List. There's a waiting and there's, list. And there's yeah. been a waiting list yeah. for the last year and a half. Um, and yeah. now there's a longer waiting list, well, the, but the waiting it's list inspiring is, the kiddies. The waiting list is a really interesting point because actually the the facilities... I remember the ESRI doing a report 20 years ago saying everybody always talks about facilities, but facilities are actually less important than you might think. What's more important is getting good quality coaches. Because yeah. good quality coaches will make do with crappy facilities and yeah. the kids will still get the access to... Yeah. And then eventually the facilities will follow. It, we kind of have this oh if you build it they'll come mentality but actually what you need to do is invest in coaching yeah. that's the single most important thing to transform a sport yeah. and uh, the waiting lists are because they don't have enough coaches yeah. it's not because you, you don't you can run around the field we'll find somewhere for you to, to do a bit of training but if you yeah. don't have enough coaches yeah. so that's the bit where the funding needs to come in and it's interesting even yeah. like I, I don't know if I don't know how many full time professional coaches there are but not many and certainly I wouldn't say there's too many professional coaches do you know who the professional coaches are? The professional coaches are the guys and the gals who have a good knowledge in athletics and are coaching the joggers out there to improve their 5k times, their 10k times, or their marathon times. So they're able to charge an individual. It's like going to the golf pro. Yeah, you yeah. go to a golf pro and they charge you 100 euro a lesson. Uh, so in terms of the joggers out there who want to be guided, they'll go to a, a guy who was a half-decent runner in, 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 in his day. He knows a little bit about running. They'll pay him and he'll help them to improve their times. But when it comes to the elite level, there will be no funding. Why? Because athletics is the poor man's sport. Mm. I am an, an example of that. You know, I come retire from my career I get involved in coaching in my club I coached a few lads over the years you know getting them ready for the Olympic Games getting them ready for Europeans or getting them ready for national championships but I'm doing that for nothing now I don't complain about it I'm happy to give back no problem whatsoever and the clubs in Ireland at the moment and in fairness to the AAI they have a wonderful system for uh Parents, for example, who, because their children are in the local athletic club, they're asked to get involved in a voluntary way. In order for them to be able to coach, first of all, they have to be vetted. And then number two, they have to pass their grade one, their grade two or their grade three equivalents. So those coaches in the clubs, we depend on them in a voluntarily way and they're glad to give up their time, no question about that. And they're able to get the kiddies who join at 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13 and 14 up to a certain standard. And when they achieve that certain standard, that's when you really need the uh, highly qualified coaches to step in and do it. And maybe there should be an educational system think more it, funded for the coaches like that. Do you think at state level that people realise the change in DNA of Irish kids now as well? Like you see in football, like that we have massive potential. Yes. That this could be something that really like benefits the nation, benefits kids in all parts of Ireland if, if, if there were some sort of investment in be it coaching or facilities like yeah I think I think a huge investment should be made because again you're depending on those parents um, to invest in their own coaching education the thing is that their their interest is generally in their own family mm. and, and as a result like that's very short term you know some yeah. some of those obviously then go on to become great local volunteers for other uh, yeah. generations and it's very important and I'm not, I'm not but it feels to me like the one block in the whole system here is actually Actually, uh, injecting a slew of professional coaches into the system, for example, from right? abroad, or like no, or? no, it doesn't. They don't have to be abroad. There's those great Irish coaches who you could just give full-time jobs to and hey. and, and upskill. Yeah, if if you look at the success of the GAA in Dublin in particular, Bertie, when his plan came in, it was to hire full-time games development and games promotion officers. There are full-time employees who are half paid for by the GAA and half paid for by the local club which almost all the money ultimately comes from the government at some mm -hmm. level, right? Mm -hmm. If we just did that for athletics, mm -hmm. we'd be much faster as a country, which would also benefit all our other sports, by the way. So that's, is that the bit that's just the, the one kind of piece of the pie yeah. 
We have massive participation. We have waiting lists, anecdotally, right across the country for athletics, but we don't have anybody whose job it is on a daily basis yeah. to make their... Yeah, well, in fairness to athletics, we have the uh, development officers uh, in there who are around the country. They're, they're speaking to the clubs, they're identifying their needs and they're trying to help them as much as possible. But I think certainly more funding needs to go into that rather than depending on a parent who's going there on a voluntary basis to coach the, the kiddies. Um, he or she might not be able to go on a Sunday, might not be able to go on a Saturday, might not be able to. So there's less of a commitment. Uh, and when from their kids people. finish, they kind of finish up as well. Exactly. Yeah. 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 On balance, are you pretty positive, or how do you, how do you feel about how we're doing at the moment? I'm excited by yeah. Irish athletics, no question about it. Um, I was away during the European Championships uh, overseas on holidays with my wife and uh, all her kids, and sure, I tuned in morning, noon, and night, and I was cheering loud all the way. And I just felt this is the first time in a long time that you really got excited about Irish mm. athletics. And I really think with the likes of uh, Adelecki and Israel and uh, young uh, Koskaran, Andrew Koskaran, uh, Luke O'Neill. Uh, you've got Kira, you have um, Sarah Healy, even Sarah Lavin. So well, like it's just really, really exciting times where now we're all, they're all beginning to think, hey, we can do this. So once that belief sets in, on top of the hard work, I think there'll be exciting times over the next three or four years for Irish athletics. I have a last question for you. If we were to run the Griffith Mile to the best athletes in Ireland, who wins? Uh, the Griffith Avenue Mile with the best Irish athletes well you'd have Andrew Costco we've got about five or six lads now all under four minutes for a mile 353 to 356 and there's, there's a, a minimum of a half a dozen of them so if they all came together that would be a great day for Irish miling and Irish athletics just to witness them and for the people the punters to be able to line Griffith Avenue on the 18th of September and see them I'd probably have to say at this stage Andrew Costco because you know he's a dogged runner and he doesn't give up and we saw that when he qualified for the uh, final of the uh, championships in in, in uh, Munich, if uh, if you want to take part, there are if you're elite and you want to take part, you can do that. If you want to go for a fun run, uh, you can yeah. do that. At Griffith Avenue Mile.ie for the tickets. That's right. You know the elite runners there will be championship timing uh, for them. For the rest of the people, they won't be championship timing, but they can run the mile. They will identify their time when they get finishes, and it'll be a fun day on Griffith Avenue. You can walk it or shuffle it. Uh, that's my experience of it anyway. So yeah, it's going to be great. Thanks you for helping us. Listen, uh, thank you coming in today. Yeah. That's Eamon Coughlin. It's eight forty-one. If you want to get in touch, we'd love to hear from you. Oh eight seven nine one eighty one eighty is the WhatsApp number. We're brought to you live. Each morning by Gillette Labs for an effortless finish to your day. Racket Magazine's Caitlin Thompson joined Richie last night on Off the Ball to talk about just what's happening with Naomi Osaka after she was knocked out of this year's tournament in the first round. John Duggan's on the other side. It just seems like she needs that run and that run just doesn't seem to come. You know, honestly, I mean, I'm not a psychologist as much as I enjoy playing one on, you know, my own podcast and with my friends. But the truth of the matter is, I think... Um, you know, she's spoken at length about having mental health issues, about having anxiety, about this, that, and the other. Um, we have no reason to doubt her. The truth of it is she's deeply unhappy. Uh, it's very obvious uh, for her own sanity and uh, for those around her. I hope that they do right by her and just sit her down. She doesn't need to be out there. We've seen that she's the world-beating talent that everybody knows she can be at her heights. But that height, as you noted, hasn't been achieved at all, not even close since the, uh, you know, Australian Open of a year and a half ago. So yeah. really, for, for what? You're, you've already got all the money. You've already got all the fame you need. Uh, she's the highest endorsed female athlete in the world. Um, but it doesn't seem to be bringing her much peace or, um, you know, happiness. And so for me, when I heard her say after last year's U U.S. Open, when she crashed out really early, that she wanted to take a, little, a break from tennis for a while, I think she meant it. And I honestly think that it was probably sponsor commitments and a very overzealous uh, schedule and obligations that didn't let her do that. And so I really hope seeing somebody who obviously does not take joy in the experience of being there, uh, figure out how to, how to take it to something else, even if that means uh, time away. All right. 8.43. John Duggan is with us this morning. John, good morning to you. How are you? Good, Jer and Johnny, yourselves? Very well. What's going on? Yeah, it was kind of a forgettable match for Spurs last night against West Ham. You really kind of feel, though. I remember going through the All-Ireland circuit uh, socially in July every Sunday, and it was such fun. The Dubs carry and the hurling final and then the football final, and you really want to be going over to these games. Like, if you beat at Anfield last night and see that 98th-minute winner, like, these are memories. If you brought a young lad or a young, you know, your young daughter to the game, these are memories you'll never forget. 
What was your first game, lads? Do you remember your first ever game in England? First ever game in England, I can tell you exactly. It was, uh, uh, fairly sure it was April the 11th, 1992, I want to say. Um, Who was playing? Villa played Spurs. Oh. My sister had gone to college in Birmingham, so we went over to see a game. Gary Lineker was playing for Spurs. Right. He got subbed off. Wow. The score was 3-0 after David Platt scored a hat-trick for Villa. Wow. Uh, they, they got it back to 3-2, so a bit of drama at the end. But by far the best player on the pitch, even though Gary Lineker was playing, was Paul McGrath, who had him in his pocket to the point where he got subbed off. Um, and uh, from that moment on, I was uh, an Aston Villa slash Paul McGrath fan. Who was managing Villa at the time? Yeah. Two questions. Because your sister was in Birmingham, that's yeah. how you end up at the Villa game. Yeah, yeah, yeah. These sliding yeah. doors moments. Um, the Villa manager, I think, was Joseph Venglos. So that would make it 91. I'm fairly sure it was uh, Venglos. So it was the season in between Taylor and the World Cup and David Platt going to Italy. So that would make sense. Yeah. Because obviously he'd scored that incredible winner for England in the round of the last 16 against Belgium. You know, the kind of over his head volley yeah. far into the far corner. And uh, so he was obviously a massive global football superstar at that point or becoming one anyway and Wenglas had managed the Czech Republic and Thomas Gravy who would have been yeah. Czechoslovakia I think yeah. in yeah. 1990 yeah. Um, I was like where did they get this guy from um, <laughs> the, where's this car from the country no longer exists we're, we're, we're going down that route this morning the previous um, I think uh, so Taylor had been the previous year and then it obviously got the England gig so and then I don't I can't even remember who replaced him. It's John was it, was it Big Ron? Away. Was Big Ron ninety three? Big Ron, Big Ron. That's it. When yes. they finished second, yeah, there. straight in after Veng lost to Big Ron. Yeah, so it's a good time to be a Villa fan. But um, up until that point, I'd been an Everton fan. I'd incorrectly picked Everton in the nineteen eighty five FA Cup final, which was stupid, you know, because the other team had Paul McGrath and Norman Whiteside and Kevin Moore. And, and Kevin Moore. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, Frank Stapleton. <laughs> I was uh, I was actually going down Nostalgia Lane last night, JD. My first game was um, March '97. Galway United versus Cove Ramblers. Just went along for some reason and uh, looked up a few old soccer magazines. So the one I got was September '97. Roy Keane was at the front. Wimbledon not coming to Dublin was one of the headlines. Bowes lost five nil against Ferenc Varos, and Adidas had just brought out a boot called Predator. What soccer magazine? Irish soccer magazine All it was right. basically run by uh, one guy um, and a couple of contributors um, Alan Dalton and reading the Going Out of Match programme more or less got me into the idea of becoming a journalist um, I had a good English teacher I loved the match programmes and then I started writing the match programme myself when I was 16 and um, one day I might become a journalist you know and one day you <laughs> might hey but it's, it's, it's yeah. so it's, it's, it's beautiful to have like we have like everything's on one's phone now. Everyone's to actually have the hard copy of yes. those programs and, yes. um, you know, like some of the photos that you've shown us of when you had Spurs jersey on in your back garden. They're lost unless you actually have a hard copy, and it's beautiful to look back. My yeah. first proper game though was Ireland Brazil with Liam yeah, Brady. Oh, yeah, I was wow. ten. Wow. Was, oh. My tenth birthday present from my dad was awesome. a trip to Lansdowne Road. Oh and then wow! That was um, Kareka. Uh, it was and like that '86 World Cup was the first World Cup that you can kind of sit and watch as a kid and go, oh, this is amazing. And that Brazil team had beaten France, who I was up for in the quarterfinals, and then they arrived, and then Liam Brady sticks in the winner. You're like, well, this is special. That is mad. Like being there as a kid. I had the ticket until recently, and then I don't have the mm. ticket anymore. But yeah, that was good. I couldn't see the goal. I could just see the people cheer in front of me. Did you do purge of tickets or something? No, I just moved house. You know. Right. I, I I'm not I I'm not a keeper, I I don't hoard my tickets, like some people. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we had people texting in that were at the USSR game, Chippy's debut in '74 as well. That must have been, oh my god! Like I mean, they, you, you, I, I, it probably would have been two quid or something to get in there, but as well. Yeah, like, if nothing. or if you know, and they were. There wasn't much sporting TV in those days. This was really, really special to see. Well, I don't think that game was live on TV. Mm. I'd be surprised. It probably would have been a Wednesday because all those it games was, were on yeah. Wednesdays. Yeah. yeah, it was an afternoon as well. Yeah. I think yeah. I'm fairly sure we bunked off school, which is controversial because my dad's a teacher. But um, you've John Giles <laughs> and Chippy Brady in midfield playing for Ireland Wait, in '74. In '74 yeah. and against USSR, like, and and I, I swear to God, I watched that back during lockdown, and we played football. We mm. actually passed the ball. It's not in our DNA to be terrible. We we just need to be coached and have players like Chippy Brady. What was your first and, game and in England? First game in England, um, possibly Liverpool Villa. Um, Peter Crouch was up front for Liverpool, so and right. scored. I'll have to look that up. Yeah, then not one hundred percent sure on that actually. Okay, let me have okay. a think. All right, yours. 
Um, Tottenham Portsmouth, uh, Easter 1988. First time in a plane, Young Flyers Club, and we lost 1 0. Oh, wow. Barry Horn scored the winner for Barry Portsmouth. Barry Horn. Uh, who ended up at Everton, and it was pretty grim. Uh, and then when the next year, saw them lose again to Liverpool 2 1, Beardsley and Barnes, and uh, Aldridge and Houghton. Good team, though. Yeah, great team uh, at Wired Lane. And then the third year I went, we won just before the 90 World Cup, Gascoigne and Lineker. Gascoigne ran the show. It was unbelievable to see him play at 11 years of age, and they beat United 2 1. Fergie's United, before United won the FA Cup. So, yeah, no, it, it was it formative to that stuff. And I do have the programme. I still have the programme of the, program of the, the, the Portsmouth game and the Liverpool game. I'm such a nerd, I'm such a nobody that I put all the Spurs stuff into the Spurs programme, I put all the Ireland stuff into the Ireland programme, I put all GA, all Ireland finals into a GA Clare programme. F- folder? Yeah, no, into the, well, into specific programmes. Okay, sorry, right. So the 95 all Ireland final, all the Clare, all the hurling tickets go in there, all the Gaelic football tickets go into the Dubs programme. Like, I'm like, like Dustin Hoffman, a rain man here. How many, have you ever counted the, the tickets? Uh, no, I only keep the good tickets. Okay. So I don't keep you know, regular tickets, and maybe that's a, a bit of an arrogant thing to say or something. But uh, I only keep the, like, the really big matches. Fair enough. Yeah, so. do, you, do you know, like, match programmes are kind of... Very few programmes. Not really a programme person. Yeah. Only, like, a specific few that would be really special. Other pro- programmes to me is... Programme is anticipation, tickets is memory. So tickets is after a programme is before. Yeah, like, well, like I had to go United match programme for the last, I don't know, eight or ten years, and it's just getting harder and harder and harder because people are just out of the habit of buying anything that's printed. And... Our program is genuinely a thing of beauty, and like it's nostalgic for me because I read that match program, you know, top to bottom, hundred times over, and was absolutely infatuated. And I would hope that some of the kids that we feature in the program or read the program have the same. It has the same impact on them, and they have it. And it's still, it's almost as fresh looking at that program now, twenty five years later, as it was in the day. It hasn't aged at all. It gives an idea for an off the ball program. We also write something for the off the ball program. If you, if you, yeah, if you don't, if you don't off the ball hour on match programs, memorabilia. No, no, and I'm actually talking about a physical program. Oh, imagine we like, we'd be distributed in the shops physical program. There we go. <laughs> program <laughs> of the game. Hey. Hat flags, headbands. Program of the game. <laughs> uh, John, you were you were talking about um, Haaland and um, we were talking about how many he'll score. You yeah. were mentioning Dixie Dean. Yeah, 1928, you got the year, Jerry, uh, in the office earlier on, is, uh, you got 60 goals uh, in, a, in one season. It's not outrageous to suggest it's on. Well, I'm beating Shearer and as Andy Cole, I think, share the record for 42 games at 34 is definitely on, if he stays fit. His injury record is good, I think. Well, uh, it's funny how last year the injuries kind of started to mount up in his last year. <laughs> so I don't know. this year he'd be wound. It may be. He's like, maybe. A, he's like a kid in sixth class who's playing against kids in third or second class. Yeah, in wait till Tyrone Mings gets in, that's all I have to say. <laughs> and also, he's very close to the goal. Uh, it, like, I was watching last night, he just, get out of my way. Your man was pulling his shirt off, man, and just into the back of the net. And the third goal, I, I just think this guy's, he's just... There's definitely a case now as well, JD. If you are a defender marking him, you're already beaten. Like when you go out on the pitch, you're psychologically yeah, beaten. The space it creates though for the other players. Yeah, that's the thing. The other attacking city players now. And De Bruyne uh, wasn't unhappy to give a little few uh, emojis in Twitter um, when the back page was one of the papers said this flop from Chelsea. Is just oh, all right, okay. Seven years ago, and he went on Twitter and he just gave a f- three like laughing emojis. That's the great thing about people this throwing shade. Somebody was throwing. Your Charleston was sh- throwing shade at somebody there as well mm. on 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 Twitter there yesterday or something like that. He Brian well. and Haaland is just it's going to be great fun. The thing about Haaland is won't play the World Cup, so that'll be surely hugely beneficial for City. What will it do in the Champions League? Obviously, like I think you'd, you'd pretty depressing. Missing link? Depressingly, they're going to win the league now. Um, but. Uh, what's going to happen in the Champions League. So Spurs, I thought, were sloppy last night in the second half. Um, and West Ham were, were finishing very strong. That's the match I watched, one all draw. Obviously watched the highlights, but... Uh, I had a very... I was flicking, and it's not very... It's not No, it's like the red zone, it, but it's not... Red, not a red zone, red red zone is great. fine, yeah. yeah. It doesn't work for football. you got to stick, I think. you got to stick to one game. I, I will actually, I think the BT Champions League goal show is great. They should do it on the nights that they have all the games. Because I would actually prefer to watch that. Then yeah. flick, 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 flick. Because you're, then you're rewinding, and they don't. BT don't have the little red button. You can just get the highlights on. Let Sky do, and it's like I have to sit here and rewind to get the goal, and I gotta watch that, and then it's like and then you gotta flick. It's Tell like, you one one bit of advice. I mean, so these are obviously first world problems. But watch it, watch it till the end. It's a good mean, bit, of, good bit of advice. Um, uh, 
Go on. Yeah, I, 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 that London Stadium leaves me cold, I have to say. I wouldn't, I've no interest in going there. Um, West Ham's, West Ham's ground. Um, Not Anfield last night. I was only ever in it for rugby, and you know, it was uh, it was grand. Yeah, uh, I think in fairness, it was I think I was at the third, fourth place playoff. So, like, who cared? But uh, it just feel you do feel very far away. Now, I I think they've fixed a lot of this fo- yeah. from a football perspective and look pretty good when they equalised. Yeah, but the, so, yeah. yeah, but the, I the, the, the mad thing is, if you if you go to football games, say in England or and in Ireland uh, or this part of the world in general, and then you go to a game in say Istanbul or somewhere like in Eastern Europe, you're like, oh, that's what an atmosphere is like, and it leaves you shivering. The, the noise of the place. I was at a like a, a Galatasaray preseason friendly, and the noise was like nothing I've ever experienced. And I've been to many Premier League games. Is that a game in Argentina and similar to that. Oh. It's like, but it's like this is this is what it's supposed to be like. I and that's, I, I yeah. left that one early. That's yeah. why I'm looking forward to Frankfurt. You know, you see what the atmosphere is oh, like. That'd be amazing. Yeah. Uh, anything else happening in the world? Uh, well, I, look, obviously it's all about tonight, folks. Isn't it? Seven o'clock. We all be glued to it. Uh, the Irish women's team against Finland. I just hope we attack. I hope we go for that. I hope we go for it. I hope we're not. Too I think concerned. we will. I think yeah. that this team that feels like that. You, you're rolling your eyes. You don't think so? I mean. Like, not, not, not according to uh, a resident expert. Vera Powell is a conservative coach. He is, but at the same time, we have uh, like it's very defensive. But that's like your solid defensive structure, and then you're building on it. It's like mm. season two of Jim McGuinness. That's what I'm. Yeah, that's oh. what we're getting to. Right, John, good stuff. Oh, lads, thanks. More from John Duggan on Saturday afternoon on Off the Ball on News Talk. It is eight fifty-five. OTBAM is brought to you live each morning by Gillette Labs for an effortless finish to your day. Now the Premier League is back. So we've teamed up with one of Europe's largest sports events, ticketing and hospitality companies, Champions Travel, to give you the opportunity to win a €250 Champions Travel voucher every day this week. These can be used on Premier League match trips as well as on a host of other sporting events. Daily winners will also be entered into a grand prize where one lucky winner will win a trip from a selection of Premier League games with flights and two nights accommodation included to enter. Who is this very recognisable voice explaining the daily pageantry required to survive in this troubled modern world? In different parts of your life, when you're at home with your family or you're, uh, you're going to work or you're <coughs> playing on a Saturday at 3 o'clock, you, 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 it is an act, it is a different show because you can't, you're obviously not acting like that when you get home. Or You can tweet us your guests on our main Twitter account, which is at Off The Ball. Now, turning our attention to NFL, we are like less than 10 <laughs> days away from the return of the American football uh, NFL season. I'm delighted to say, Kian Fahey is with us. Kian, good morning to you. How are you? Good morning. We're seven days away, I believe. I'm trying to avoid saying who that very uh, difficult voice to guess is. I'm just going to want to brush it out in there, you know? That's all right. I think everybody, we, we've made that one relatively straightforward for uh, for people this morning. Uh, it's the 21st anniversary, 21st anniversary of the handshake? Uh, yeah, 21st, 2001. Yeah, yeah. Um, something you'd forget is how pivotal Roy Keane was in the goal which you'd actually like I think Yap Stam just kind of fell out of the way and it's like that was Keane comes on and says I'm trying very hard not to I'm say the name I'm trying to avoid it yeah <laughs> C-I-A-N yeah sorry well, I think everyone knew anyway <laughs> Keane Faye good morning to you how are you Moving on. Nearly nine o'clock. Uh, good. good. Uh, <laughs> you said it's uh, less than 10 days. It's seven days away from the NFL season. But I think the NFL is unique in the sense that it's been eight months since the end of the last season. The last season is longer than the actual season itself. So even this last week is going to feel like forever because the, the running is so, so difficult, so long. It's like, I can't wait for it to actually start and get going. The bit that happened over the last three or four days was that the massive training rosters that they had uh, gets cut down to 53 men. So you're allowed to have 53 and then you're allowed another practice squad you can call people up to. But the 53-man roster is actually really important. Loads of very famous players have been cut over the last week or so, which kind of gives you an indication of the strength and depth of some of the different teams. Was there anything specific that stood out to you there before we get into the quarterback carousel? No, I think the the big story, like, it's the way it works every single year. Like I said, the offseason is so long that you can kind of get changes in the sport without getting like transfers or, or players playing with new teams because the beating they take during the season and then the carryover of aging for eight months means guys can very quickly go from being really, really good players so there are no names to suddenly being not physically able to stay on a roster anymore. The one that kind of stands out, though, and the big story from this preseason is Kenny Galladay because 
he's that wide receiver for the New York Giants, and he's probably the highest paid wide receiver at one stage, or he was at the one stage, and he was given this massive, massive deal to go to the Giants and be the star wide receiver from the Detroit Lions either last year or the year before. And they just want rid of him, and they can't get rid of him because of financial aspects. Or if they did, they took a huge penalty to do so. And Galladay is this incredible athlete, incredible wide receiver, incredible talent. But his uh, his effort has been criticised there. I think unfairly at times. But his fit has also just been a major problem. And that's something you find in the NFL. Like you have to have the right scheme fit. You have to have the right fit with the right quarterback if you're a wide receiver, especially. And then you have to be physically able to sustain through all the beatings you take. It's why the average length of careers there is less than three years. It's why players fluctuate so much a guy like Odell Beckham can go from being a superstar generational talent has an ACL tear and now suddenly he's just on the free agent market and not be able to get a job because physically he's not where he needs to be um, the player that you want to start this uh, quarterback conversation around is uh, Tua Tunga Viola he's the Miami QB a lefty who suffered a horrific injury in one of his final college games and that has essentially put him behind the eight ball ever since now they've got a new head coach. They've got an incredible investment made in a supporting cast. And so therefore you would say it's all set up for him to succeed. Um, are you a, a two and on? Are you a two a truther? Do you think he's going to make it? Well, first of all, I'd like to commend you on the pronunciation of his second name because even I don't go that far in, in trying to do it properly. Tonga Vailoa it's supposed to be, but that's not far from the way it's spelled. Um, Tua is fascinating because... Tua, you mentioned the hip injury. He had the hip injury at Alabama. Tua played as the starting quarterback at Alabama. And what that means is he was the pinnacle of college football at one stage. He was the best or one of the best players in high school. So he was a superstar, superstar prospect. And then he destroyed his hip. And he has a hip now that you think would be like a 60-year-old or 65-year-old normal person's hip because it dislocated. That's not a normal injury. It's not something like an ACL that you see all the time. So he still comes out of college and comes out of Alabama and is a really high pick for the Miami Dolphins. They're desperate for him to be the franchise guy. He's the best uh, thing that they, they think they're going to get for the last 20 or 30 years since Dan Marino. They have all the highest of highest hopes for him. And now he's entered the NFL. He's played 21 games. He's playing against the 1% as a 1%. And he's not only doing that at a difficult position. He's doing it at the most difficult position in sports, which is a quarterback, because you have to master everything about the position or you're not going to be even effectively good at all. And the real story about him is he's doing all this while throwing the ball with his wrong hand. Tua, when he was a child, his father taught himself as a coach and he taught himself as a bit of a visionary. And he said, if my son controls the ball with his left hand, that will make him stand out more. That will make him more valuable. So he's actually right-handed, but he's played his whole career throwing the ball with his left hand. And it's a weird thing because you can actually see it in the way he throws the ball. He's not natural throwing the ball at all. He's not comfortable throwing the ball at all. He's done it well enough to reach the NFL, which is an incredible achievement. But he also has very, very little arm strength. His passes often just die in the air. And this is why over the last two years, the first two years of his career, they've always thrown the ball very, very short. They, ha they haven't been able to push the ball downfield. They haven't been able to hit tight windows. He hasn't been able to drop back in the pocket and rip the ball into a, a closing window the way a Justin Herbert can or a Josh Allen can or even a Lamar Jackson can. But he has been effective enough that the Dolphins still believe in him. And besides that, they brought in a new coach, like you said, Mike McDaniel, and he's going to an offense that pushes the ball downfield. He's going to an offense that relies heavily on intermediate throws, which is 10 to 20 yards downfield, and deep shots, which is more than 20 yards downfield. More often than not, he takes a deep drop in that offense as well. So you can add 10 yards to any throws, throws he makes. So if he's throwing the ball 25 yards downfield, it's probably going to be a 35 to 40 yard throw more, more than likely. So he's now in a position where he's going to make these throws, and they've invested huge amounts into Tarn Armstead at left tackle, one of the best left tackles in the NFL, or at least he was when he was at the Saints, and the big uh, story of the year, Tyree Kill, Patrick Mahomes' number one receiver, who is built to go deep, and he's built to play with a quarterback who has a huge arm. And it just doesn't seem like it's going to be a good fit. I think it'll work to a degree because the offensive scheme there is a perfect fit for Hill and they'll get guys wide open for Tua to throw the ball too. But at the end of the day, they saw it with the 49ers and ultimately your quarterback has to make difficult plays, especially in the playoffs. And Jimmy Garoppolo couldn't do it when he wasn't being carried by the scheme and I don't think Tua will be able to do it when he's not being carried by the scheme as well. Okay, so ultimately that might end up um, doomed to failure and they'll be on the, the market next season for a new QB. Somebody who has been on the market, you mentioned Jimmy Garoppolo there, he will be backing up Trey Lance in San Francisco. They uh, cut his salary by 16 million and he's sticking around he's only going to be earning 6 million to sit on the bench and uh, carry a clipboard so not bad work if you can get it unless he's going to start at some point in the next few weeks or a couple of months 
Well, it's one of the best jobs in, in the NFL in sports is to be a backup quarterback because you can pl never play and make six or seven million a year, eight million a year even, and Garoppolo's getting to do that now. And he has a no-trade clause and he has full control of his future. From the 49ers' point of view, it's not ideal. It, it's, it's a problem. It's a multifaceted problem because, one, you expected to get some return for him. There was talks of getting a second-round pick even for him at one stage. That was always a bit outlandish. You're still probably hoping that someone gets injured and then he'll waive his no-trade clause and you can get something back from during the season. But then it's also disrupting you because you kind of wanted Trey Lance to be there and Trey Lance to be your next guy and you can just fully focus on Trey Lance. But now Jimmy Grapple's always going to be standing there. He's always going to be a picture of him behind. And as soon as he has a bad game, there will be a section of the fan base that's like, Jimmy G was great. Jimmy G won us games. Let's bring Jimmy G back. And Trey Lance is the polar opposite to Tua in that he came through college without being uh, a superstar. He wasn't a highly thought of prospect in high school. He wasn't a highly thought of prospect coming out of... Um, I mean, he was actually, sorry. He, he was a high pick in the draft. But he wasn't necessarily a celebrated player. He was a developmental player. He's a freak athlete. He's got a huge arm. He can run all day. He actually, ironically, reminds, reminds me a lot of Colin Kaepernick, who the 49ers jettisoned famously or infamously all those years ago. And now he's got an opportunity to play with Kyle Shanahan, who is a similar system to what we are talking about in Miami, where they're going to get wide open receivers. They're going to get him easy options. And all he's got to do is execute on a base level technically to do that consistently. And that will uh, allow the whole offense to prosper because of how physically talented he is. But from what I've seen of Trey Lance, I'm not 100% sure he's going to be able to do that. Like I said, the offseason is really long, so he could have developed a lot over the last eight months. He could have developed a lot over the last two years while not starting. But the glimpses of him that we've seen have not really been exciting. Have not really been, oh, this guy looks like he fits. He looks like he belongs. He looks like he's going to easily take on, on this uh, th this league and become a superstar. But I guess the, the argument against that then is you guys like Josh Allen and Patrick Mahomes, who at the start of their careers looked like they didn't know what they were doing, and then eventually it clicked for them. And that's what the 49ers are hoping. I, I think I, I didn't really mention it with Tua. I should have mentioned it with Tua. He's the most important player for the whole league because the Dolphins are set up to be a Super Bowl contender if he plays well. But if he doesn't play well, the whole team will completely crash. I think you can say similar about Trey Lance. The 49ers aren't at their peak talent-wise, but they have a good coaching staff and they have an overall amount of talent that's really, really high. So if he hits, if he hits even to an above-average degree, I think that team becomes a, a force in, in the NFC West. And it, it combines with the Seattle Seahawks completely falling off. They're, they look like they're going to completely rebuild starting Geno Smith, which is an insane thing to do in 2022, and uh, Arizona Cardinals, who are dealing with DeAndre Hopkins being suspended and who are having their own infighting with Kyler Murray and, and Cliff Kingsbury. So I think those two teams in their division are probably going down, which leaves just the 49ers to challenge the Rams. And the Rams, coming off of Super Bowl teams, tend to struggle a little bit coming off of Super Bowl, and the Rams are a, a relatively young and inexperienced team. It's not like they've won three and four Super Bowls. They know what's coming up. They, they're going to experience new things this year they haven't seen before. You mentioned him there. How good is Josh Allen? Josh Allen is one I famously kind of have issues with calling him a superstar and stuff like that. He's a freak athlete. He's he's as much as you call him. It's okay, him it's else, okay sometimes yeah. to admit you got it wrong, Ken. Don't worry. It's it's it's, it's, it's I, a I, sign I, of your development down. as a human being. Double down. No, so here's here's the thing for me. I think he's so when he came into the league initially as a rookie, he was a complete and utter disaster. Like physically couldn't throw the ball, was didn't know what he was doing, running all over the place, falling all over himself. And I think he's developed to a level with his accuracy that's become above average, become very acceptable, it's become quite good. But the one thing I w I'm still wary of, and it's the same thing that happened with Carson Wentz and with Garoppolo to a degree, he plays behind an exceptional offensive line. And when the offensive line uh, plays to that level, you don't see a quarterback in the most difficult circumstances yeah. all the time, which you see with other players. So I think Josh Allen has become one of the better quarterbacks in the league. I think it's an incredible testament to his development, an incredible testament to what he's been able to achieve. But I still think it's premature when people compare him to a Patrick Mahomes, compare him to a Tom Brady or Aaron Rodgers, or the very, very best quarterbacks in the league. But, I mean, he, he's still young. He's still developing. 26, he's still yeah. He's that superstar. He, he, uh, his, his progression is such that you would expect him to be able to get there if he continues at yeah. that level, notwithstanding the point about the, the offensive line. So let's, let's he see He also has to be put in that position, though, because if, it, it happens eventually with everyone. Like Derek Carr has kind of been found out a little bit over recent years. He started his career behind a phenomenal offensive line. But to keep a phenomenal offensive line, uh, you need five players. Uh, offensive linemen are as difficult to find as quarterbacks. But you need five of them who are high quality, and you need five of them who work perfectly together. So teams never keep them for more than like three or four years. Or you need an amazing coach, uh, which so, yeah. doesn't it's seem to be too many of those around. Somewhat, per somewhat uh, personal question, which is um, probably <laughs> irrelevant. How, what is going on with American football in New York at the moment? How are they both effectively 200 to 1 to win the Super Bowl? How have the Giants become so bad? The Jets are always like, it just, it just defies belief that the Giants could be in the wasteland that they're in. 
Pretty much everything starts with the owners. You've got Willie Johnson in New York, who is uh, famously a good buddy of Donald Trump, so you can understand how he runs his businesses, and you, I don't really need to explain further with the Jets. They're a, a complete and utter travesty. They tend to draft a lot of players who everyone else kind of scratches their head and goes, why did you pick them? That doesn't make any sense. So they've had these decision makers at the top who just don't, like, who are happy to take money and not really uh, incisive thinkers or, or thoughtful thoughtful people or innovative play, people, is what I was trying to say. They also have uh, a tendency to go for what they call a football guy, which is generally just a guy who is old and gives out and complains about things and likes to talk about getting dirty and, and running the ball and that kind of stuff, which is just an antiquated way of building football teams. It doesn't work anymore. The Giants have had similar issues with David Gettleman. Since Eli Manning retired, they haven't really moved past that era. And David Gettleman came in and he's since gone, but he literally, at a time when Patrick Mahomes and Tyree Kill and all the small players in the league were cutting up the league, he came in and said, Football is about having the biggest guys. So he just kept drafting these big, massive offensive linemen and defensive linemen, and every team would just run around them and run past them and, and make it easy on them. And they've also tied themselves to a quarterback called Daniel Jones, who is not good enough. And it, he, But it's actually it's kind of fascinating. In the NFL, it's best to draft an awful quarterback or a great quarterback. You don't really want to draft a below-average one or just a bad one because you'll always be able to convince yourself that, oh, we'll make it work with him, yeah. even though mm. it's very mm. clear you're not going to be able to make it work with him. And that's kind of where the Giants are right you're, now. You're in purgatory. Very quickly, Russell Wilson, is that um, is he the new Peyton Manning? Got to go to the Broncos and win? As in, how quickly do you want this? Can I just go, no? Okay. Uh, <laughs> I can explain it a bit further, but like the Seahawks didn't get rid of him because they were moving on to something else. The Seahawks got rid of him to reboot because they looked at him and saw, oh, he's an athletic quarterback. He's been really, really great for us. But he's also someone who relies on his athleticism primarily, and he's getting old. And he's not necessarily taking a lot of hits, but he plays in a certain way that's not going to age well. So I think they'll be very lucky if they make the playoffs in that division. If they were in a different division, they could be a playoff team. Okay. But they've got to compete with Justin Herbert, Patrick Mahomes, even the Raiders who are rebuilding a little bit. Okay, quick 30-second answers. Marcus Mariota in Atlanta, good or bad? I think this is one that's really going to surprise people. The Falcons over under for the year is 4.5. I think they easily eclipse that. Mariano's a really, really good quarterback and they've got a bunch of talented uh, pieces in there. Mariano's uh, another one who's a, a great backstory that we could go through it, uh, in a longer way in a different day, but he kind of was brushed out of uh, Tennessee after being a star early and then came found himself in a bad situation, then get, went to the Raiders as a backup for two years and now he's trying to restart his career. Okay, so um, you know he, he might actually flourish there. Matt Ryan in Indianapolis, is he washed? I think he is, but like we just talked about, the Colts generally set the quarterback up for success, good offensive line play, good scheme play. So I think that's going to be a really interesting one, and it's a soft division. The Texans aren't going to be good this year. The Jaguars are never good. The Titans, I think, are regressing a lot because they lost A.J. Brown. They lost Johnny Smith the year beforehand. The pieces there are slowly eroding away. So I think they're in a position where they're very likely to make the playoffs, and he's got Jonathan Taylor there as one of the stars in the league right now, which will take a lot of pressure off. And then the last one is, you mentioned the Jags. Trevor Lawrence in year two, what's going to happen there? Ooh, that's a hard one to talk about uh, in short detail because he was in a, a, an insane situation last year where his head coach was going around kicking people and calling people out and embarrassing them. And that was his first year in the league. So I think there's a reset button for him in year two. He's a good athlete again. He's got a big, strong arm. I think technically he's lacking some qualities that he's going to need. So hopefully he's able to show them off. If he shows them off, most people think he's going to be the next superstar. So if he takes that step forward, and year two is generally when quarterbacks do. So he could be an interesting one to watch more than someone we know a lot about yet. All right. Keen, good stuff. Thanks a million. Cheers. Thanks, guys. That's uh, Keen Fai. You can follow on Twitter for more NFL goodness. OTBAM brought to you live each morning by Gillette Labs for an effortless finish your day on uh, OTB Sports Radio today. Loads of good stuff. Jerry Eisenberg talking about Muhammad Ali. Declan Murphy, the jockey, and his book, Centaur, Caring for the Sports Person, is our retro panel. And, of course, we've got Leaders' Questions with uh, Stuart Lancaster as well. But from half past five, our build-up starts for the Republic of Ireland against Finland tonight. Cathy McNamee is uh, in on hosting duty. Nathan and Emma Byrne are on commentary from 7 o'clock. And for the day that's in it, we're also going to have a deadline day special from uh, 20 past 9 all the way through on the football show as well. After the break, we're back live with the Daily Mail North East football correspondent Craig Hope to reflect on a bit of heartbreak for Newcastle last night at Anfield. See you next. OTB. AM on OTB Sports Radio, Ireland's first and only sports radio station. Man City lose Kira Walsh, they're not competing. Did get yellow carded very early on in the match for being a bit too eager coming out of her goal and taking out, I think it was Leah Dalton. But, uh... <laughs> Subscribe to the OTB Koyig pod on the OTB Sports app now. If your business relies on a van, 
That wouldn't sound good, but this does. Get up to 75% off van insurance. Now available in FPD branches nationwide. FPD Insurance. Support. It's what we do. 75% no claims discount based on five years claims free. Available on new van policies used for farm or business purposes. Terms and conditions apply. Underwritten by FPD Insurance PLC. FPD Insurance Group Limited trading as FPD Insurance is regulated by the Central Bank of Ireland. OTB AM. With Gillette. Get into your flow with the new Gillette Labs Razor with exfoliating bar. 13 minutes past nine this morning. Craig Hope is with us. Craig, good morning to you. How are you? Morning, guys. Very good. Looking, for, looking forward to tomorrow as, as journalists, as you probably know, deadline day. Uh, yeah, is it one to be enjoyed or one to be endured? I'm not so sure, but I'm looking forward to tomorrow. That's that's for certain. I couldn't believe when I was looking up last week that uh, last night wasn't the end of it. I presume it was something to do with the fact that there were fixtures on and uh, the old fax machines might have been otherwise engaged, faxing through the results of the matches or something. I, I, why are we in September and the bloody window is still open? And I, I couldn't agree more. When I saw the fixture list and I saw that Newcastle were at, at Liverpool on August the 31st, as a journalist, you think perfect because your mind is going to be distracted with the game and deadline day will come and go and, and you won't even you won't even realise. But sadly, yeah, we've got another another day of it to go. So, yeah, let's see what it brings. Do you expect anything incoming or outgoing around Newcastle in the next 12 hours or so? Uh, potentially, yes. Uh, now, I know they would have liked to have done more. Certainly at the, the start of the week, they were exploring perhaps one, maybe two more permanent deals, uh, in a, certainly in a, in a defensive midfield position. Uh, they've looked into the likes of uh, Yuri Tillemans, uh, Leander Dendonka at Wolves, uh, Douglas Luiz at Aston Villa, Dennis Zachariah at, uh, at Juventus. And I don't think, from where we are now, I don't think any of those are probably going to happen. So they're still looking around for, for a defensive midfielder. Probably a lower move that would be. In terms of outgoings, Martin De Bravka will join uh, Manchester United today on loan. Now, they wanted to get through last night's game without any problems to Nick Pope before they, before they signed off on that. And after three minutes, Nick Pope went down and called called for a doctor. So for a moment, it did look it did look iffy. I think Martin Dubravka would have been watching that one through his through his fingertips because he really wants this move to Manchester United. So I don't expect a great deal, but they are still active. And like I said, the loan move would probably be the most likely. I did I did mention some of the stats earlier. Like there, Eddie Howe was really getting the optimum out of his team because stats wise, last night they were absolutely battered, but could easily have won the game. Yeah, they were. And what I will say is so. Yeah, it doesn't matter who plays for Newcastle at the moment. And last night they were depleted. They didn't have arguably the three best forward players. You know, Alan St. Maximum, uh, Callum Wilson, and Bruno Gomorrah were all out with with hamstring injuries. Even, even at the back as well, they didn't have the £32 million defender Sven Botman in there. It doesn't matter who plays at the moment. You can slide identify with Newcastle a strategy, a structure, and an absolute buy in from every player on the pitch. Now, that hasn't always been the case in, in recent years, certainly not under, under former managers. Now, that is an absolute testament to, to the work that Eddie Howe is doing there at Newcastle at the moment. And as you say, you know, even though Liverpool had more of the ball, Newcastle didn't allow them to do anything with it for the first half. The first half, for me, was up there with one of Newcastle's best, best performances of the season, even one of the best under Eddie Howe. I, I, I thought they were tremendous. I really did. And, you know, of course, come the end, there is the, there is the heartache. We might, we might get on to that. But, uh, but yeah, last night was just an example uh, of, the, of the brilliant work that, that Eddie Howe has done. And as I said before, the absolute buy-in of the players. And, and Craig, we were uh, re- reminiscing uh, about the, the four threes and, um, you know, 26 and a half years, I think, since the initial one. And uh, mm. if, there's, if there's something Newcastle love, it's definitely a marquee striker signing. And I'm thinking of Asprilla back in the day and the glamour that he brought what about the incumbent though and what like it could easily have been the perfect two goal debut in victory at Anfield it could have been and, and you know the, the second one as well regardless of whether it was ruled out or not and you can debate that you know technically it probably is offside regardless of all of that what he went on to do in what was a, a real live game situation at the time the flag hadn't been raised was quite phenomenal to sit down to sit down to the two defenders like he did and then find a way past Allison again I thought was was just tremendous and he, he, he went off at the, well, the last half hour there but, but what a what a shift he put in you know he worked hard there was there was class there was composure he's finished the way he, he just gave the goalkeeper the eyes as well and he whipped it in it was it was fantastic and already he has the he has the feel of a of a real hero and now I, I've been saying all summer, and I got a little bit of stick for this about three or four weeks ago. I went on, on radio over here, 
And I said, it wouldn't be the worst thing in the world if Callum Wilson felt his hamstring before the end of August. Now, I didn't want him to tear his hamstring, but the reaction among supporters was, you're stupid. What sort of journalist are you? You know, you're saying you want players to be injured. I said, no. I said, I just think they've taken their, their eye off the ball with regards to what the team really, really needs. And for me, the priority should have been all summer was a striker, someone to come in and compete with Callum Wilson. Now, they, Callum Wilson came back towards the end of last year. He, he'd come back from a very serious Achilles injury and had done very well. Now, I think that had swayed thinking internally as to Callum Wilson perhaps going a, going a full season and being the main man. I don't think he can, as good as Callum Wilson is, I don't think he can rely on him for that. Now, to bring in Isaac for me is the, is the player in the position who could really make a difference for Newcastle this year between, between you know, them being a team who competes for the top 10 to a team who competes on the coattails of that top six, top seven. And certainly the early signs last night were, were massively encouraging. We had Graham Hunter on the show last week and we were asking him specifically about what kind of impact he could have. And he said, look, at this stage, you're buying potential. Nothing wrong with buying potential, but that's all it is. He's had a difficult season. He's mm. missed sitters. He's missed chances. Two years ago, his goal scoring record was way better and something happened, there was something going on. For him to hit the ground running was actually really important. Those words were ringing in my ears when I saw the finish last night. I was like, right, well, all of a sudden the confidence flows because we understand that like these humans, despite the amount of money that they get paid and that it gets paid for them, they're not robots. So if you're a striker and you start scoring like that at Anfield, he's going to be feeling himself. Those sitters aren't going to get missed this season. And that's... that like. You know, we, we can overstate how important a good start is, but in this instance, it doesn't feel like that. Any word on the injury? Is it anything serious or anything to be worried about? No, no, just, just a dead leg. Dead leg, uh, yeah. It, it should be fine then. Uh, uh, the point you made there, which is interesting, so I'll bring you back to the importance of making a good start. Now, John Dal Thomason has recently he's returned to this country. He's manager of, of Blackburn now. Now, John Dal Thomason came to Newcastle as a, as a 21-year-old in 1997. On his, Not many people remember this. On his debut against Sheffield Wednesday at home, Tino Asprey put him through on goal after 30 seconds. Thomason had, from the halfway line, through on goal with the goalkeeper, and he missed. And he missed badly as well. Now, I've always said if that had gone in, John Dal Thomason's Newcastle career might have, been, might have been awfully different. It is important, a good start, because it just gets the fans on side immediately. They, they, they've got a hero to buy into. And you could, see that, you could see that last night. The goal lifted him. And scoring the first goal probably gave him the confidence to do what he did for the second goal that was, that was ruled out. And you mentioned there, uh, Graham Hunter, you had him on your show earlier in the week. Well, we've got a, we've got a man in Spain too called Pete Jensen, and people wrote a bit saying that, you know, Newcastle have probably paid the, the wrong fee. For, for, for Isaac, bearing in mind how he did last season. Now, on the evidence of last night, yeah, they've paid the wrong fee. They probably haven't paid enough. <laughs> so, uh, but yeah, there is a feeling in Spain that £60 million, pounds, bearing in mind he only scored three La Liga goals last year, is too much and they are investing in potential. But what I will say with regards to potential at Newcastle right now, you have got absolutely the right manager in place to bring out the best in to, 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 to fulfil that potential now. Like, well, also, like, I mean, it must have been a billion spent or whatever in the Premier League. Like, does it, does it actually matter? Is this even a relevant debate anymore given the ownership of the club as well or there was 60 or 80 or whatever? Does it, is, it, yeah. is it even remotely relevant? No, it is. It is relevant because you've got FFP and you've got parameters you've got to work within. So you can't afford to get £60 million signings wrong. If you get a £60 million signing wrong, you can't just write them off and then go and buy another one because that, that, that money is gone and... and even even this summer, Newcastle didn't want to go as high as they've gone. The total spend, I think, is 115 million. Even though, listen, those are structured deals which are spread out over the next two, three, four years to to to, to circumnavigate FFP restrictions. Mm. But at the same time, no. To answer your question, you can't go throwing around money willy nilly. And where Newcastle are at in terms of what they've currently got coming in, which is still really. You know, it, it, it's a Mike Ashley club in terms of commercial revenue, in terms of even even tickets, uh, player sales. You know, the, there's no one there with any real value who, who they can sell apart from maybe to an Alan St. Maximum. So, uh, no, they've got to be really careful. They've got to knock their recruitment out of the park. And so far, they've done it. And the, 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 the little example I go back to is, for the same £80 million that Manchester United paid for Harry Maguire, Newcastle have put together a brand new back five of two England internationals, Nick Pope and Kieran Trippier, Sven Botman and Dan Byrne, and Matt Target left back for £80 million. That's impressive. They've done well so far, and they've got to continue to do that. I think the other thing you're talking about is, is Eddie Howe and the plan, and there's a structure there as well. Um, it, it does seem like uh, Eddie Howe is a manager who has a very specific style of play that he wants this team to 
grow in and to use to get up the league. Can you talk to us a little bit about what that actually is? Because there's been some criticism that it's a bit defensive and that maybe the new owners are going to want some more Harlem Globetrotter style stuff. But like that's not really, you know, he he doesn't want to be Claudio Ranieri at Chelsea. He wants to be uh, Jose Mourinho at Chelsea. Mourinho style, as we all know, they, that team scored loads of goals, but they were bloody good defenders and they made sure that they didn't concede goals and it seems as if while Eddie Howe is now finally splashed out in a striker that his first primary concern was to build a defence and a defensive structure so that anybody who comes in and plays knows exactly what their job is Yeah but, but then what he has done that absolutely he has done that he's built from the back he inherited it, an absolute mess at the back from Steve Bruce but uh, yeah and, and upon those foundations Newcastle Newcastle have built and it's probably been the cornerstone of the success since January onwards but why does a manager have to be wed to, to one definite style or one definite system? We've seen in the space of a week now with Newcastle, they've arguably adopted the strategy depending on the opponent. Manchester City at home, and they didn't have loads of, a, a, a lot of the ball, but they went for them and they played with a, a very definite strategy to, to catch them on the counter-attack and get St Maximum into the game and it worked. St Maximum wasn't there last night, yet they still found a way to cause Liverpool, Liverpool problems. Uh, Wolves on Sunday. Now, they went to Wolves on Sunday, and I'd arguably, I'd say arguably, it was the worst performance out of those three games. They had a lot of the ball. It was a different way of playing where they do want to dominate, they do want possession. That is the way Eddie wants to go, but they didn't do a, a great deal with it in the final third. That probably comes back to personnel, which is why they're trying to improve the attacking areas with regards with regards to recruitment. So, you know, what Eddie Howe has shown so far is that he's adaptable. And he said this himself, last night at times was quite ugly. Well, you know, bra- bravo, you've realised that is the way to, to, to potentially go to Liverpool and get a result. It is about industry, it's about press, and it's about structure. Uh, you know, it, it's about sitting deep at times. And it, it worked perfectly until the, until the 98th minute. So, so, yeah, he's adaptable. And, and I have to say this, I'm someone who's been on your show before, invariably to be critical of managers, be that at Newcastle or be that at Sunderland. I've always sort of said what I, what I thought and what I saw. With this guy, honestly, trust me, I couldn't have been more impressed. Uh, he's, he's, he's believable, he's intelligent, he's hardworking. I honestly, I've said this before, I honestly think he could be one of the next great British coaches. They're, How? they're, four, they're fifth in the table in the calendar year and like they're literally just getting going. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the form, the form from January onwards was was incredible. Really, to put themselves in the, the top three, top four, a team who entered the the year uh, fighting relegation again comes back to to the to the work that Eddie, that he's doing. Even this, the league, listen, they've dropped at the bottom half after last night, but the league table's a little bit of a lie. You know, they, they, they've been away at Liverpool uh, only beating the ninety eighth minute. Manchester City, they came very close to. To, to, to beat and of course so it has been an encouraging uh, start of the season even though they're on the bottom half and my expectation is that I think they've got to get European football this season because you look at some of the players they've got in there now Sven Botman Bruno Gamaric Alexander Isaac they haven't come to Newcastle not to be playing continental football so there is a little bit of pressure there but I absolutely believe on, on what I've seen, what I've heard, everything around it so far. I absolutely believe that is achievable this season, a top seven finish. Uh, pardon my, my ignorance here, but Botman and Gamarish, they're expected back relatively soon, is it? Botman was on the bench last night. I, I, I just think it was it was a case of maybe his rotation right. uh, last night with regards to defenders. Botman's OK. Uh, Bruno Gamarish has a hamstring strain. Uh, we're told that Saturday is probably unlikely, the same for on St Maximum and... Uh, a week on Sunday down at West Ham is the more likely return date for those two. But things can change over the next 72 hours, we'll see. Yeah, OK. N- neither of them are like chronic long-term out till Christmas type no. things. So we should we should see the team settle into a rhythm over the next while. And the games are coming thick and fast. So, uh, you know, that, that strength and depth is going to be hugely important to them. Um, the point you make about the potential for the coach... How long is his runway? Like, you know, because it's it's likely that when you set a new team together and you sign all these players, that there might be a little bit of a betting in period. There could be a bit of a blip. Does he have any rope? He, he do well. He's just signed a new long term long term contract there uh, two weeks ago. So so he does. I think the owners, like myself, couldn't have been more impressed by him. Uh, and that is as a result of the feedback you get within the club. Uh, now, what Eddie Howe's greatest his greatest success, but one of his biggest successes so far has been not only to keep the players in the team happy, but to keep the players outside the team happy. Now, the previous manager here couldn't even keep the players in the team happy. So, uh, yeah, so to, 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 to that regard, you know, I use that phrase, buy-in. When Eddie, Eddie came in in, what was it, November time, and one of the first things he did was he put himself on the line, he stood up in the canteen, 
in front of the entire squad and all the staff and went through his full life story. Now, that included, you know, the very painful death of, it, of his mother as well. Uh, you know, who was, who was a single mum. He's spoken about that previously. And he put everything on the line for them. And I think the players walked out of that uh, that that meeting and just said, wow, we, we want to play for this guy. And over the course of the next two or three weeks, uh, after every training session, after lunch, one player was encouraged to stand up in front of the group and repeat what Eddie had done. Put their life, you know, put their life out there. Things that perhaps wouldn't have shared with teammates before. Put it out there. And because of that, you know, they, they have grown closer. You, you can see it. There is an undeniable undeniable bond there. The amount of late goals they've scored, the amount of times they've, they've salvaged points that perhaps shouldn't have shouldn't have got. So, you, know, you went into the question there, you know, talking, putting it back to me that I said he's going to be one of the next great British managers. I, you look at his age, he's 44 years old. Now, that. Stephen Gerrard and Frank Lampard are a similar age and they're being talked about as, as relative rookies on a, on a Premier League stage, you know, young managers. Well, they're the same age as Eddie Howe. Eddie Howe has already got 14 years of a, a, a body of work beneath them. Now, not all of that has been good. There's been a relegation with Bournemouth. There's been accusations of, you know, poor recruitment at Bournemouth, which I don't think is entirely accurate. But why can't you learn from that, you know? Well, that's, sorry, that, that's a really good point because we, we actually had somebody on who played under him and said the man management wasn't great. But that was in his first job. Like, he was mm. calling uh, players who were older than him son. You learn from your mistakes. And he yep. has gone through that period where... The other two who you mentioned uh, uh, doesn't seem to be learning from their mistakes at the moment. I'm a Villa fan, so I'm, you know, I'd much rather have Eddie Howe as the, the manager of Villa than, and it's never going to happen now. But um, so, I, like, it, it's clear that he is somebody who takes on board feedback. You know, that's my roundabout way of getting there. Yeah, but what he spent, he's, he was out of work for what 18 months between Bournemouth and Newcastle, and he spent his entire time, not his entire time, but a lot of his time digitalizing every uh, every coaching session he'd ever put on. So, you know, he's got the the resource there now to pluck a session from this this digitalized. I mean, you could argue there's better things to do with your time, but you know, he went away and during that that period, he looked at his weaknesses as a manager and improved himself. And you know. Isn't that what life's about? You know, re- recognizing weaknesses rather than sort of pig-headedly carrying on with with what you've done previously and believing it's going to work. He's he's intelligent. That's what it comes back yeah. to. The man is intelligent. I have two last questions. One is uh, afterwards, Klopp was complaining about the time wasting, and um, so they've just won in the 98th minute, and he says it's going to be a game that everybody remembers forever. But he's still taking time to go. But they were time wasting. Um, if I'm a Newcastle fan, I'm delighted about that because they care. And we've got under the skin, and the next time when we play them, we will time waste because Liverpool will do it to us. And all of a sudden, they, you know, you're, you're getting the respect of being disliked by Klopp, which I think is probably important. Maybe I'm reading that wrong, and maybe he's just being nasty afterwards because he can be because like he's the boss. I don't know. Yeah, I thought Eddie was very dignified afterwards uh, with regards to the time and, and all the rest of it, and I wouldn't expect anything different. Uh, what I will say on the on the time is now. I haven't necessarily, on a whole, got, got, a, got, got a problem with it because I've written it and said recently that I think we are being cheated out of, out of minutes that if the football is on the pitch. I think the, the research at the start of the season showed, you know, some matches as low as four. There was a Newcastle game recently as low as 46, 47 minutes. Now, how, how is that the case? It's just scandalous. So my, my solution to this was, and we did a little bit on the Daily Mail, was, you know, just play longer at the end. Play seven, eight, nine, ten minutes as the norm as opposed to two or three. So... In principle, I haven't got a problem with them going beyond the, the allotted allocated time. Where I have got an issue with it last night is it's because it's still so unprecedented. How many times do you go three minutes beyond the five which is which is put up? And even five at the time felt a, a little bit excessive. Now, Nick Pope was down injured in injury time, but I think someone's timed that and it was it was a minute and a half. So so where do you find the extra two and a half, three, three to, to play beyond that? I, I don't know what you guys think, because I, I think it is a, an interesting point. For, for for debate, I just think for me, you know, it doesn't normally happen. So I can see why Newcastle are aggrieved that there was a point on about ninety six and a half minutes, a minute and a half after the, the allotted five, where you thought, right, he's going to blow the whistle now. Newcastle attack had broken down, and lo and behold, it didn't, and that was the the offensive Liverpool scored from. But I, I don't know what you guys. Think. Well, it always never happens. It happens in Gaelic games. It rarely happens in football. Um, your point about the additional time is completely accurate. We just take it for granted that oh, it's a throw. It took forty seven seconds. Yeah. That's grand, like you know. And then there's two minutes. But yeah, I mean, there's like several substitutions, and the time's never added. Yeah, on. it's it's it, the inconsistency is the thing that drives everybody crazy. That's mm. it. Like, uh, but I think you're right. Just play eight or nine minutes as a matter of course, and it, it kind of all of a sudden people forget to time waste because there's no point. Mm. Yeah, that kind of cures yeah. it. The last thing is obviously about the the fans and the ownership and um, 
what is the level of comfort at the moment amongst the fans with the Saudi owners? Has that has that story completely disappeared? And because the, the sports washing is happening in all aspects of all sport at the moment, we see it in horse racing. We've talked about this this week. We see it in golf, where the Saudis are basically t- trying to take over the sport. Uh, with with them coming over and owning the club, um, how important is that? Do, is that discussed amongst the fans at the moment? Is it still a real life topic? Mm. I'll give, I'll give an honest answer here with regards to support as no, no, it's not. Uh, we, I think support is from, you know, as a, as a journalist based up here and, you know, is surrounded by, by fans on sort of a daily basis, immersed, immersed in it. I think they've been able to, to park any concerns they may have about the ownership and concentrate on, on what is it, what is for them a, a football story and the, the love of the football club. Now, we can argue the, the, the wrongs and, and rights of that, but that is the reality, and that, that's an honest answer I'll, I will try to give from a from a journalistic perspective. Uh, you know, at, at the start, I can only speak for my own publication, but at the start, I think we covered both both sides of it very well because there are two stories to start, to tell here. There is the the issue of Saudi ownership and, and what is sports washing. I mean, it, you know, they are buying into to sport to. To, to, to enhance their, their their reputation to you know that that is that is unavoidable and there are there are certain elements of that that, that do leave you uneasy and do have to be explored and and maintained uh, you know you've got to keep on at that journalistic now I think as a newspaper the Daily Mail has has done that uh, you know I'm employed as a as a football reporter up here it doesn't mean I, I turn a blind eye to that you know I have spoken about that and I've, and I've written things about that side of it but I've also got to cover a, a football story as well with regards, you know, the, the Premier League matches, the press conferences, the transfers, everything else around it that is taking place. So, so no, it is still there. There's certain elements of it personally I'm not necessarily comfortable with, but at the same time, you know, there is a there is a, a football club there, a football a, a manager and players, and the manager is doing a very brilliant job, and we've just spoken for 20 minutes there about what is a a fascinating subject with regards to the incomings. You know, Newcastle's turn around from what they were under Mike Ashley and Steve Bruce to what they are in the new ownership and anyhow now. So, you know, there is interest there. We can't, we, we've got to cover that. We, we've got to do the best we possibly can to, to tell that side of the story as well. So, so yeah, there's there's contradictions and there's conflicts uh, and that will probably continue to, 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 to be the case and that's me trying to give you an honest answer yeah no I think I think, I think that's fair I think um, you, you see with all fan groups that the ownership is an issue when things are bad and when things start going well when you sign a, a striker who bangs one in with his first 15 minutes you're like hey you know um, and that is the contradictions of life Craig it's always great having you on one last thing um, John Dahl Thomason's first game was in Dublin you guys came over for a, a three three team Pats Chelsea and um, Newcastle were over because I remember because I remember he, he came off the bench and wasn't very good and uh, <laughs> Kenny Dalglish I asked him about it in the press conference afterwards and he was very spiky he had the head off me because I haven't recovered I, well I was like I was, it, was a stu- it was a kind of stupid like one of my long rambling questions and Dalglish was kind of like well that guy's going to be a superstar and I was like well, so I, I watched with interest then as um, is this the first time you've ever the story I was uh, right well I mean I I I wasn't. I knew. I knew then even less than I know about football <laughs> now. And it was like, uh, it just he'd, he'd missed. He'd, he'd come on and had just hadn't like because he was was he not replacing Shearer or was was Shearer no, still there? He, no, she, Shearer was injured. So right. uh, if Shearer hadn't been injured, then uh, you know I think it would have perhaps lightened the the, the load on John Dal Thomason. But he went in as a twenty one year old. Uh, kid in his first season in England, and it was all just a little bit, a little bit too much for him, really. But went on to have it, went on to have a very good career. Of yeah. Course, so yeah, yeah, great well, career. And, uh, seems like a great football man. But Kenny Dalglish was not happy being asked about his new signing on his uh, on his do- debut in Dublin. So it turned out it wasn't only Dublin he was missing. <laughs> Craig, great to have you with us. Thanks. Cheers, guys. Take care. Bye bye. It's Craig Hope with the Daily Mail. They're always great to have him with us. OTAM brought to you live each morning by Gillette Labs for an effortless finish your day. It was the old Lansdowne Road. Yeah, I went to, I think it must have been the previous year, uh, Newcastle, Derry City, um, Celtic. Celtic might have been about, maybe it's a quadrangular, the Dublin yeah. quadrangular tournament was the marketing for it. Organised a bus up from East Galway to um, Lansdowne Road and yeah, exciting times. And it was, yeah, I remember it being quite good fun actually. Oh, thank yeah, you. Seeing these, these players in Dublin or whatever. Yeah, and they were all obviously hanging out and uh, exploring the flesh pots of Dublin and getting in trouble.
the idea I don't again I was 15 it was kind of you were also exploring the flashpots of Dublin I was not I was going home and reading match programmes <laughs> and looking for the shift OTBAM back tomorrow from half past seven Adrian Barry and Shane Hannan will reflect on tonight's massive game in Tala alongside Kathleen and former Ireland and Arsenal goalkeeper Emma Byrne Daniel Harris will be on to react to Man United's game with Leicester City tonight the final deal or no deal of the window with Phil Egan plus much more besides right uh Talking about the situation with Johnny Gall struggled to find a new manager with Caro Kane and Brendan Devaney in conversation with Richie last night. Enjoy this. Let's switch our attentions to Ulster football. Pretty intriguing time in the post-season after the championship because Donegal still don't have a replacement for Declan Bonner and it appears that Monaghan are heading the trajectory of the Dublinification of the rest of the country with the potential appointment of Jer Brennan as their new manager and the exodus from Tyrone continues. We have Cahar O'Kane uh, joining us on the line and also ex-Donegal star Brendan Devaney. Gentlemen, you're very welcome uh, to the show. Brendan, I'll start with you first. The Donegal situation, it's the lack of any kind of smoke, white or otherwise, that I guess is probably starting to concern people up there more than anything else. Yeah, you're right, uh, definitely, Richie. There's um, so many stories uh, spinning now. You, you hear something, it's funny how people approach them, you know, with uh, with the with the whispers that it's that it's fact almost. Like a few weeks back, I was hearing different people, you know, even people that are uh, well-known in GA circles here t- telling you that the likes of Martin McHugh was a... It was a shoe on it was his job more or less and then you speak to martin he's like oh no way it's it's not for me now and um you know the pair the people i think who we want to take the job are finding uh, we're finding that hard to get them i think the people who want the job we might, might necessarily want them they're inexperienced you know there's different people in the background they're trying to put teams together that uh, they, they want to take a chance on it whereas i suppose some of the experienced names out there are distancing themselves from it and I think geographically, there's always an issue here, Richie, here in Donegal, about getting people in that are, how you would say, you know, at the very top of the management. There's not a lot of guys out there that have, you know, credentials that maybe teams like Donegal would want that are within range. And if you even look at the likes of Rochford coming into Donegal, the distance that he's travelling, there was a guy that was involved right up in the, obviously, All-Ireland finals and that. So come into Donegal, huge experience and was, uh, you know, a huge uh, coup at the time for Declan Bonner. So, you know, the fact that Declan Bonner, all, all his experience that he had, that he was ready to come in, having uh, been very successful at Donegal underage, it was a ready-made replacement to take in players and join them in with um, some of the brilliant players from that uh, McGuinness era. So at the minute, you know, who is out there that's in, in Donegal terms, that you know, people's on about Jim. I mean, Jim's obviously gone down the soccer route and that's where he wants to stay, it looks like, you know. So Malachi Rourke, for me, is the only man out there, you know, at the minute that he's got this proven track record everywhere he's went. He seems to be someone that Donegal's maybe courting that they're in talks with him in terms of he's the only person that seems to be standing out now. I mean, Enda McGinley's been mentioned. I mean, I know Enda well. It's it's he said the next time he takes county management on, he's gonna to have to take a career break. It is so uh, life changing. So I mean people are throwing up likes of Maxi Kern who's been involved with Jim in his time, you know, taking the ladies, taking St. Unions, um, Guido were been involved with different teams. Roy Cavan, of course, won the championship under Jim and you enough manager. You know, people have mentioned the names like that. But uh, as it stands, you would say that head and shoulders above all them would be somebody like like Malgay, of course, last season taking um, you know, um uh, Wadi Graham's to, to a championship first time ever. He's obviously still involved with them. So whether that there is the stumbling block at the minute, that information coming out or, or what's happened, nobody knows because our county board are, are, are keeping tight on who they're speaking to, who is the candidates and who's all involved. Yeah, Cahar, it's probably a, a better situation for Donegal, as frustrating as it might be for the supporters, that they don't necessarily have the beauty contest and the beauty pageant that went on with Mayo over the course of the last few weeks before the appointment of Kevin McStay and his sundry band of all-stars, that there isn't this, you know, there's four different teams lining up almost, not necessarily of mercenaries, but you kind of get that expendables feel uh, about the teams that are being assembled. There's none of that, at least from the outside looking in on Donegal. What are the names that you've heard mentioned associated with the job or potential bids for well, there's probably happy medium and all that stuff, as as Brenton says. That maybe maybe the caliber of of management teams at Donegal would like to attract as well. Um, probably aren't in the setup or aren't in the in the conversation at the minute. Look, Brenton has probably summed it up very well there in terms of hearing a lot of the same things I'm hearing. Malachi Rourke is the name that keeps coming back at you, but the problem there is his involvement with Glenn. Glenn are are again among the few. They are the favourites to win the Derry Championship. Um, 
if that goes well for them, they go into Ulster, like the first round of Ulster for the very champions of the 12th of November. Donegal can't sit about and wait and see what happens. Um, difficult for a manager to commit to a county job while he's in a club job. It hasn't gone well in the past. And that could be a real stumbling block for Donegal. I think Malachi O'Rourke is definitely the man that they want. But whether the timing is just not going to sit right and that that could scupper the whole thing because it's um it's such an as Brent said, it's such an enormous commitment. Mm. The idea of double job and even in the early season, like we saw what that did to Down last year in terms of like Down sat on their hands and waited for Connor Laverty to finish his his Down championship campaign with Kilku. And then started looking about that ticket with Conor Laverty, Marty Clark, and Jim McGuinness that was talked about. That fell through. And it was the 25th of November before James McGirt was appointed. They ended up so far behind that the, the whole season was written off before it ever started. Yeah, and, that's... And Sorry, Donegal, or the, Donegal, like this is the 31st of August. I'm just double checking there, but 31st of August. And uh, Donegal are at the point where they need to be appointing a manager now in the next week or two. And that's very early for the like of Malachi Rourke. And yeah. as Brenton said, there's nobody else, you know, really jumping out of the out of the conversation. It's it's a weird position, uh, Brendan, I guess, for the county to be in. And it's one that Carr alluded to there. Like Down found themselves in that with the appointment of James McCartan. I guess crossing codes as Tipperary were seemingly waiting for Liam Cowell to become available, they had to appoint somebody uh, this time last year and they put in uh, Colin Bonner. That didn't work out, but it shows that a year can be lost and any momentum that you do have, and it wasn't the best years uh, regardless, but any momentum that you do have really does get lost if you're kind of starting on the back foot as whoever the appointment will be, given that it's this late in the day. Yeah, and just as Scar was saying there, just the giant nature of the job, you know, it's as if you're very lucky in certain counties if you've had a bit of success and someone steps up. You know, if you look at Park Joyce coming into, coming into Galway, someone of his level, probably the best forward arguably I'd ever played the game, and he comes in with this unreal attitude that I'm just going to take this team forward. We're going for an All-Ireland title. I mean, coming in with that type of, of, of rhetoric, only certain people can carry that. And if you look at the best teams in the country, there, there's always, because you've had so many All-Ireland winning teams and players with you know your top teams, obviously your Dublins and Kerrys, etc. Now, Tyrone's as well. There's always a conveyor belt of people queuing up to take the job, and there's a conveyor belt of talent coming through. And I think in certain counties, then you might just get lucky from time to time that certain people are in the right place at the right time. And again, as we've been saying there, that, that actually want to take on a job as massive as a county job now. And if you look at McStay's ticket there, the the, the experience and the panel that he's brought into that. Of course, he's retired and. We all know about Jack O'Connor, the oldest manager in history. They take an All Ireland title last year, retired. And I think, you know, we had this flavour of young manager coming through. It's almost now like it doesn't suit so many people at certain ages with with their life and what's going on. So I think to to land that job and anybody now, and particularly a job with Donny Gaw, and particularly with a lot of abuse that came around the Declan Boner towards the end of that job, I think a lot of people could be looking at that, thinking, right, what what exactly is in this for me? You know, particularly if you're coming from outside the county. You know, you have to be coming with a real love of football. There obviously will be a financial side to that as well. But if you're in Donegal and you have a family and you want to take on that challenge, geez, you would, I mean, thick skins not would even cover it. You know, you you would need a suit of armour on you. So, and, and with Donegal being at a rebuilding time as well, um, you know, you're going to need patience. And I'm just looking, is that patience out there with your normal GA fan now I'm not sure so you know everything's pointing people away from the job rather than rather than to it it, it should be something that I, I suppose in many ways it's, it's a bit of passion it's a bit of a love it's, it's a massive commitment but I'm just wondering a bit like the commitment of the players now are we tipping the scales too much against a lot of these guys for taking the job because there's definitely no queue queue up really in Donegal and even those players we're talking about maybe they've won all Ireland there's only a handful of them that's been involved in a bit of coaching you know um uh, likes of Leo McLoone, Eamon McGee were involved in the under 20s this year. And and as I say, Rory Cavan has been involved with Donegal underage, under 16s, and has taken St. Junins and that. But it's a massive leap from thinking that you can, you know, take a club team, say, to, to, to a championship to take on the, the whole of the Donegal job. Because I bet, like, Rory's a, you know, he's, he's a school teacher, he's, he's got four kids, he's busy. 
you know, you just wonder sometimes now, it's only going to suit people in a certain uh, type of job in a certain time of their life. Yeah, there is an element to that as well. We saw Andy McIntyre, I guess, spoke about it very uh, vividly on this show as well about the abuse car that he took while well, in the latter stages of his uh, Mies tenure. Uh, you know, Brendan alluded to it there, the stuff that Colin Bonner perhaps had to put up with as well in his latter days. Like, it's a full-time gig without necessarily the benefits of uh, a full-time gig. You're kind of in the public eye in a way that you probably wouldn't want to be. You're taking on abuse in a way that you wouldn't want to be that probably isn't commensurate with the job that you're doing. It is a very difficult ask to get somebody to sign up for that, especially when, you know, in Donegal terms, they probably do need somebody on a three, four-year term given the rebuilding job that needs to be done there. It's, it's just becoming increasingly difficult. The pool has got very shallow um, in terms of the people who who a want to be in their county managers and b then have the capacity as well there are probably people in, in other in a lot of counties who, who maybe put their name in the frame but but players are are unhappy at the idea of of conceding a couple of years of their intercounty career to somebody that they don't feel has a capacity to take the team forward so they're all looking for names players are looking for names and they're looking for reputations you look at the Take the Kerry set up last year. Obviously, you had Jack O'Connor at the head of it. You had Paddy Talley, a former Down manager. You had Michal Quirk, a former Leash manager. Mayo set up now. You have Kevin McStay, former Ross Common. You have uh, Stephen Roachford, Donegal and Mayo. You have then Donny Buckley, who would have been a coach that, that people love to attach the ticket to strengthen it for them. So in, within two inter-county setups, there are six big names eaten up. And that has left the pool very, very shallow for an awful lot of people who then don't have the experience and don't have the big name to attach to their ticket. And it's left that, you know, I think we're seeing more and more counties really struggling to get men to, not just to do the job, but men that will appease the players and and make the players buy in and that you're getting everybody out and playing. And I mean, for the abuse that you take and the time that you invest in it, it has become an enormous, an enormous job and a really, you know, an unforgiving job and a job that you can understand why there are not queues. Like Donegal, you, you know, I, talking about rebuilding, like Donegal have still been in 10 of the last 12 Ulster finals. Their age profile outside of Michael Murphy and Hugh McFadden like, is still very good. You know, I still believe that within that Donegal team that's playing, there's more progression that could be made. So I don't, I don't necessarily buy that they're that, that they're rebuilding for the next few years. You would think that that's a job that would be attractive, and yet they are struggling. Mm. Brendan, like when you were talking to Enda McGinley about you know what he did in intercounty management, like what kind of errors is he is he talking about being a regular day if he's in charge of Fermanagh? Do you know what um? Just as you're chatting there, Kehar, that's the first positive stuff I heard in a while. I could get you on a ticket tonight if you want. There's been a few boys where I get Kehar. I like a bit of positivity. And we, we are, we, you know, sometimes we saw... What's I, the I, money like, Brandon? What's the money like? It's euros, by the way. Sorry, I, 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 you love the queen heads, my man. But, uh, no, Richie, you know what? I think it was it was more when we spoke, it was the headspace yeah. for, for Enda. Like, Enda, as you, you know, you've seen him on there. He's obviously been doing great punditry work. Me and him were doing bits and pieces for, for a good while there with um, uh, Be Radio Ulster. So we got to know him quite well. And I do a show up here in Highland and we get him on there and he's a fantastic lad. But he was just saying that just he couldn't leave it. And he says at times he was managing upwards of 60 people in that squad between players and, and physios and S&Cs and everything was going on. And he, what he said which was interesting too, Richie, was that you know some of these people are very, um, I suppose, highly educated, highly motivated type people mm. that you're coming across and you're the person that's given the order, if you like. You know, it was interesting how he, how he described that because, you know, for years there, I think in GA, you know, the changes have come in this last, like, 25 years or that have been phenomenal around, say, the type of people you're dealing with and what's happening and, and it's ever changing. And, 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 you know, it was interesting what Kahar said there, just about players' attitudes to you coming in. You know, you have so many aspects to, to what you have to do, how you come across and how you lead and, and how you get that and bring that all together if you like it, it's, it's an interesting thing that Kara throws up because certain counties in um, are going to have issues with people coming in. And we've seen that before. If it doesn't fit, 
you know, you're in trouble. And if there's certain egos or people on the side then that you used to things a certain way, you've got all these things going on. And that's why I think it's such a massive job. But it was just, it was interesting to say that Enda, he hadn't written off that he would do a county again. But he was saying he literally would have to take a career break to do it, which is mm. which is interesting and, and very honest of him to, to, to say that. You know, that that's the worry, Car. I guess is that the job with Donegal is actually so attractive. Like you've got that pool of players that you mentioned there. You've got the support that notionally will be there behind the the county with each and every outing that they have, and it's just it's a massive uh, landmass in terms of uh, in terms of actual like county. They've got loads of great players, great pool of of, of clubs to to pluck from, and yet if a county like Donegal is finding it hard to find candidates. What does it say about the state of the game in general that they don't want to step forward for it? That's absolutely it. Um, you, when you see a county like Donegal struggling, I suppose you, you, you mentioned the Mayo situation earlier, like they were probably the opposite. They had, they had men queuing up everywhere looking the job and, you know, you would think that Donegal would be in that bracket. You know, they're established Division 1 team. They're they're going to be around all their titles. They're still potentially... You know they should they should have been in all Ireland semi-finals and, and should have probably done better over the last eight years on that on that front, but but they should be one of the most attractive jobs in the country. Now, the thing for Donegal is Brenton will, will well know is is the geographical kind of isolation as well, and where you know if you're a Midlands county, you can pull people out of Dublin, mm. or you can pull you know Donegal. Where are you pulling from? You're pulling from Mayo, or you're pulling from inside. You're really in Tyrone and and Derry. Like f- for all the talk about, you know, f- for years, Mickey Hart under pressure, and you know, and Fergal Logan and Brian Duher w- were lined up from way back. Whenever Mickey would go, Fergal Logan and Brian Duher would would step in. But you know, beyond that, it wasn't an awful pain even jumping off the page. And there's loads of fellas that have been around the club scene in Tyrone and done well and. But there's, you know, nobody really jumping off the page at you um, in, in that regard. So so Donegal are probably slightly unfortunate when, they, and this maybe plays into the fact that they don't have a, a big history of outside men coming in to manage them. So, you know, it plays into that as well. So they're, they're probably an unusual, um, an unusual incident or an unusual, uh, I can't think of the bloody word, <laughs> but, um, they, you know, most counties, I think, are going to have that are going to have that struggle. They're they're just outside of the top five or six now, where there are potentially big trophies to be won. I think a lot of counties are going to struggle because of simply the time commitment that lends itself to, you know, you pretty much have to be retired, teaching, or working for yourself. Where you're earning, you're earning enough money that you don't have to put in a ninety-five anymore. You, you, you maybe run a small business, something you have people doing the work for you. That, you know, that's about basically all the lifestyle that you could have that would afford you the time to manage an inter-county team, which is, you know, danger, very dangerous in itself. But you know, I've always argued that the the way here is not that we start paying everybody and we start taking them out of their professional jobs. I, I think the way here is that we, you know, we're seriously need to look at rolling back on the hours and the time and that obviously feeds down to the players as well. Has the you know horse bolted on that aspect though? Because you, you can take you know the, the professionalism of the game in every other aspect other than cash is quite evident, and you know the hours that the players are putting in, the hours that management are putting in, video sessions that go into it, all this kind of stuff is professional in nature, and you can't exactly ask people to go back because you've brought them this far. You don't, you, people won't want to regress their own games as such and regress their own abilities in that sense, Car. It's tough. It is. That, that's where it's at now. It's really tough to, to ask people to regress. And, and if you do, do they start to look at other sports? Because they're used to such a high standard um, of professionalism, such a high standard of preparation, round games, and they see it going backwards and they think, Just, I can't be bothered with this anymore. It's not the same as it was. But equally, you know, so many players you would speak to would, would have found a real you know, change in their own attitude during COVID when they realised, you, you know, just how much time they were actually committing to this. You know, a few managers would have found a real, you know, almost took a step back themselves and said, you know, do, do we really need 
the gym sessions? Do we need, really need to bring everybody to the county centre of excellence to do gym sessions? Could we not do those remotely and save the fellas the travelling time? And there were small tweaks that came out of the of the COVID thing. But look, when the when the iron was there to be to be struck uh, with the debate or the argument or the row between the GPA and the GA over the expenses being renewed and 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 the the cap on sessions that the GA wanted, ultimately the GPA pushed really hard to get that cap lifted uh, and I know they were working on different things around contactors and there's an ongoing discussion but but I felt that was an opportunity for everybody to reset and say look cap cap your sessions at, and, and everybody has to abide by it anybody going beyond that they just don't get their expenses paid I think players wouldn't stand for being asked to train six times a week and only getting paid their expenses for three and the cap was an obvious solution but it was turned away when it was there. I think the the debate, the GPA pushed very hard on it, and it'll be hard to bring that back round when you know the the Esri report that was out a few years ago and the the hours, the the average of thirty one hours a, a week that intercounty players were putting into it, it was an, an enormous amount of time, crazy, scandalous amount of time. This this felt like an opportunity to pull back a wee bit from that. And it was it was turned away in favour of you no. Know, we need our we need all of our sessions covered for all of the year, and I just thought that was a mistake. Mm. Brendan, what's your sense of it? Is there any way that this can be rolled back in terms of the amount of man hours that goes into these? Yeah, it's it's, it's difficult because I think and, and I agree with you hard that, that something like that. And I just wonder how many ways is there around these bloody things, and particularly for the for the more successful counties that have the money to say right here this session it's been sponsored or looked after or there's money there. I think that's an issue we haven't really spoken too much in, tonight about. And if you look at some of those management teams we're talking about, there's there's players from different counties coming to them. And you think on uh, uh, the likes of uh, uh, Jack O'Connor um, uh, pulling in his management team this year at, at Tally coming down there. And even the likes of Donaghy going to the Ironman and, and as you say, Ratchford coming to Donegal. And, and like big expenses involved in that, you know. And I talked to a county board official actually, and they were saying that the a Donegal County session costs around 10 grand a session. Uh, OTB AM with Gillette. Get into your flow with the new Gillette Labs Razor with exfoliating bar.